Hello and welcome to Fresh Face Comics, the comic book podcast where a lifelong comic book reader guides his friend through the world of comics for the first time. My name is Julia Morgan, the aforementioned lifelong reader. With me as always is Jacob Licklider, the aforementioned newbie. I suppose I have to say Jason Todd did in fact do some wrong things this time. <laughs> a few, just a few. Just a um, few. May have chopped off a few heads, thrown them in a bag, you know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Killed some more people. <laughs> Um, yeah, so today uh, we're talking about Batman Under the Red Hood, um, and as as you can already tell, uh, Jacob is regretting a few of the things he said a couple episodes back. <laughs> um, only, only slightly. I still think at least Robin Jason was an innocent boy yes. who did nothing um, wrong. Also, just to be clear, we're assuming on, I'm pretty sure, the safe-to-assume knowledge that everybody knows that Jason Todd is the Red Hood. You know, I mean, it's a twist in story, but like, but also considering this is a 14 issue collected edition and the reveal happens four issues in. Yes. And also, well the, as... and also the, the animated film is super well known. And Jason Todd as the Red Hood is a very commonly used character in modern DC comics. Um, I don't think it's a big issue to say, hey, J- Jason Todd is, 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 is the is Red the Hood. Red Hood. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, just, again, working off of that, if that was a spoiler to you, uh, we apologize, but I doubt it is, to be honest. Um, it's something I, I knew going in was was happening. Yeah, um, but of course, you know, we are we are starting off on our non-spoiler section, as always. So we will be uh, light on spoilers to start with, and that'll pretty much be Jason Todd being the only thing that we're going to spoil early on, I would say, you know. Um, other than that, our conversation for the first, usually, what, 10, 15 minutes we take? 15 minutes, uh, it'll, be, it'll, depend on, it'll depend on what happens, because... I have thoughts. I yeah, have yeah. Thoughts. I am sure you do. So yeah, kicking off our non-spoiler section. So you read Under the Red Hood for the first time. If I remember correctly, you watched the animated film a long time ago, correct? I did. I did. Again, about about a decade ish. So two um, questions to start off with. One, how much did you remember from the film? Or and two, what is the story about? So one, I remember. The, I remember what is the. Fine, what ends up being the final scene or so of of the actual story arc. Okay. But Under the Red Hood. So this is tech. This isn't a spoiler for Under the Red Hood, but it's a spoiler for the story immediately before it. Um, so Under the Red Hood is the almost immediate reaction to the death of Stephanie Brown. Temporary death of Stephanie. Temporary death of Stephanie. I mean, all Brown. comic book deaths are temporary, aren't they? <laughs> well, except a couple, though. So. <laughs> I'm sure. There, there's there's a pretty big one in modern Batman comics that they, that they still haven't undone, and I'm kind of surprised they haven't. So I I don't know what this is, but okay. oh, you'll find out someday. <laughs> I'll find out someday. Um, but yeah, so Stephanie Brown is dead, and. Because this is because Bruce Wayne does not know how to control his emotions, he has pushed away his family, um, and has thrown himself into being Batman, right as the Black Mask has a new competitor for Gotham's drug trade, the mysterious Red Hood. So, who, um, yeah. Uh, so, so this actually brings me to a Twitter question I wanted to bring up right off the bat because I thought it was a great talking point to talk about what the significance of this character is. Um, So uh, our friend Mason at the GD256 submitted a few questions. This one I really want to hone in on, though. Um, His third question, we'll get into the others later on, is why is he called the Red Hood if he doesn't have a red hood um for those unaware and 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 it's it's one of my favorite things about this story the red hood is an old moniker used by the joker before he became the joker if you've read the killing joke or you know some pretty basic information about the joker yes, before he famous be- issue which i have a copy of i just haven't read it yet Yes, it's, I've, it's, I've actually read that story too, um, which is kind of funny because it starts off as just as like, ooh, who's the mysterious Red Hood? And it's just the fucking Joker. And there's no bigger meaning to it other than just the Joker started wearing a new costume. <laughs> um, 
it's, it's really pointless. Um, but then, you know, uh, people like Alan Moore gave it a lot of meaning and, you know, it's, it's like, oh, it's it was this um, it was this this moniker that was used. It was passed from like criminal to criminal just to hide their identity if they needed to pull off a job really quick and, and, and get away with it easy. Um, so this was given to the guy that would eventually become the Joker. Uh, he was wearing this costume uh, that was called it was, it was the Red Hood outfit when he fell into the ass and became the Joker. Um, also, it's not a hood. Like, yes, it, it, the, the look before this was the typical purple Joker suit with a red cape and a big ass dome on his head. Yeah, and like, um, and that was it. That was the red hood. So here, um, he doesn't actually wear a red hood. He wears this sort of like helmet mask thing, almost like kind of like Deathstroke's mask. It, it seems, it's, but it's, it's like I mean, it's a motorcycle helmet that's red, yeah. basically. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, and so yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't like literally mean a hood. It's never meant a literal hood. Um, it's just it's just the look of it, you know. Um, so yeah, so 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 when it comes to figuring out the identity of the Red Hood, and considering we've already talked about it being Jason Todd, um, that 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 name means means something to this character, and it, and it's one of my favorite things about Jason's identity post resurrection. It's this it's this great idea though, and I'm. I'm kind of glad they haven't tried to, like, they haven't really given Jason another identity post to this. Yeah, yeah, it's always just like Red Hood after this. You, yeah. could, you probably could have. Um, and I think the story's brilliant at setting up a potential Jason Todd redemption arc, but mm-hmm. I don't entirely know if that happens. Uh, there are other stories that follow up on this, and uh, we will very likely cover them on the podcast someday. Okay. Well, because I know then, like, Four issues after this, Damian Wayne is a character who exists now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, this is in such a weird, like, a weird place in comics history, because going in, um, I I had initially thought, of course, the way Jason came back was the way the movie did it, but Mm -hmm. was discovered that that was incorrect. Yes, we're not going to go into that non-spoiler, of course, Um, but there are actually a few Twitter questions about that topic. (laughs) That topic, um, yes. Which is which is pretty funny. Um, so let's get into this one question from uh, our friend Kean. Uh, at Kean the Quark says, firstly, film is based. Yes. It, I mean, it's 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 one of the very best DC it animated films ever. somehow manages to distill this 14-issue arc down, cutting out a decent chunk of the middle, but you don't feel it being missing. And, mm-hmm. and I would even argue making the story more effective in places. Yeah, definitely. Well... More effective in what it's trying to do as well as different contexts, because yeah. and, the uh, reason I brought up the death of Stephanie Brown is because that is, for at least for the comic, and, and for the comic and the collection itself, that's kind of essential context to mm-hmm. why Bruce Wayne acts the way he does, and I think that might be something that some people misinterpret just a little bit, because he is kind of acting differently throughout this because Jason coming back is just another gut punch that's yeah, yeah. fucked with his emotional state. Um, but as always, uh, we'll talk about adaptive material at the end of the episode, so stick around for that. Um, also, secondly, Kian says, I can never remember if this book is a result of the retcon punch. Um, and without getting into spoilers, in short, yes. Yes, yes it, it, it's, it's, so. it is. But what's interesting is that it started publishing nearly a year before the retcon punch happened. Yeah, <laughs> like so. There's that. Like I looked uh, up the dates on this. This story arc at 14 issues published between the end of 2004 and like March, April 2006. Mm-hmm. Like, and then like there's okay. So if if you get the collection, there's a gap of uh, four issues. Uh, no, three issues in, in in like in the middle of it mm-hmm. that aren't part of the story. It's like a different writer taking on something. Um, and like time is meant to have passed in between those chapters, so it it it, it works and it doesn't it doesn't like disrupt the flow or anything. Mm-hmm. But it's it it explains just why this story took like two years, n- nearly two years or so, to actually like get out and write and be weird, um, mm-hmm. as as well as really surprising me with how good it is. Like I was. I was expecting a decent story. I wasn't expecting a really, like, like, this was very close to getting, like, 10 out of 10 up there with the greats as, as mm-hmm. like, a perfect but, Batman story. But I did you ahead of time that the last issue in the collection is is pretty bad. Like. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, the last, <laughs> there's one part of the story that's really bad, and I think there's a bit in the middle where it kind of does suffer just a little bit. Um, okay. From some pacing issues. Um, All right. Uh, for like an issue or two, but then it gets itself, then it manages to pull itself back together for a really good conclusion. Yeah. And then um, the last issue, then the, the, the annual happens. Once again, we're dealing with a, an annual in a story arc that just doesn't work as well as the rest of the story arc. Yes. Um, but our next Twitter question comes from Jamie at Jamie underscore season seven. Ah, yes, DC's Winter Soldier, but not as good and also full of infinite crisis stuff. Okay, bitch, listen here. Look, Jamie, I love you. Fuck off. Under the Red Hood is infinitely better than Winter Soldier. And I love Winter Soldier. I really do. 9 out of 10 book. Fantastic stuff. Under the Red Hood is so much better. Fuck I mean, you. this is also a 9 out of 10 book, at least for me. But then again, I haven't read um, Winter Soldier. And uh, and then Jamie says, speaking of Infinite Crisis, when are you making Jacob read it? There are no plans currently. <laughs> Well, I'm sure I'm sure we'll read it. Eventually. It will happen someday. It, it's it's an important event in DC history. It, we'll probably read it someday. Yes. Um, uh, so getting into the other questions that Mason asked. Um, one, uh, this may be a spoiler question, so I'll keep it vague. But how does he come back? You know who I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in the spoiler we'll section. It's, I stick will around say for that. It's it'll be towards the end. Of the spoiler a yeah. very convoluted way of doing that. Like it'll it'll be towards the end of the spoiler section. We'll be talking about yes. it. So, um, so then uh, his second question is: Apparently, the movie is fucking awesome for this story. Thoughts? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's, every, it's, it's every, really everyone should good. watch it. It's got Bruce Greenwood as Batman, Neil Patrick Harris as Nightwing, Jensen Ackles as Jason Todd, and John DiMaggio as Joker. Fantastic. Oh, and also uh, Jason Isaacs as Rachel Ghoul. D- Jason which, Isaacs. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just amazing. And also, Wade Williams' black mask is something to behold. I love it. Um, it's so good. And uh, Mason's last question. Uh, when are you having esteemed unpublished author, the GD256 Esquire, back on your podcast? Uh, uh, well, I can tell you this I, down to the date, the 30th of January, 2023, Mason. Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, I know the episode number. <laughs> I, I have my spreadsheet pulled up with the dates for those, for specifically those you, for this question. For those of you who aren't insane, uh, it's episode 34. Stick so around. 34. I don't know what we're covering. Uh, yeah, but it's episode 34. It's episode 34. So um, our next question comes from uh, our friend Rachel at Chell's Seashells. says, what's under the Red Hood is the obvious question. I think the real mystery is hidden in plain sight. What is the Red Hood made of? Um, Jacob already said it's basically a motorcycle yeah, helmet. It's like a bo- some I kind think of it's metal. supposed to be reinforced with Wayne Tech shit. Yeah. Because, like, it heavily implies that Jason was stealing from Bruce throughout this story. Mm-hmm. And uh, among other... I don't know. Well, actually, it'll probably be Cord Industries tech in this one, at least. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, our last Twitter question comes from our friend Marcus at Sir Jedi Sentinel. Says, "Isn't John DiMaggio just one of the best and most underrated Jokers?" I wholeheartedly agree. Honestly, yeah. Like, ooh, like that performance He's was so like, good. Like most like, of my like, notes on the movie are literally like, "Holy shit, these performances are great." Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like, as far as like you know, voice acting only jokers. Like there's Mark Hamill, there's Trey Baker. We all love them. But John DiMaggio is so good. Like so, so good. Um, yeah, just fantastic. And then we also got one last set of questions from uh, our friend Andrew. Um, he, again, if you watch the last episode, he messaged us privately. He's no longer on Twitter. So um, his questions come in. Uh, first off, a question for Jacob. After reading this story, do you feel like you prefer Jason as Robin or Red Hood? I mm, So this is actually difficult. I'd love to read more Jason as Robin, just just straight up Robin, just out of just out of curiosity. But I think with the way Under the Red Hood ends, you can have a really good, like I said earlier, a really good Jason Todd redemption arc, as well as then building on to have him stand on his own, like you have, you know, Dick Grayson standing on his own as Nightwing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think I think that just intrigues me, like, mm. like, like if um. Uh, I know it's a question for you, but if I can weigh in, I, I for me personally, I mean, Jason's just an infinitely more interesting character as Red Hood. So 
there's that. Um, his question for me, though, reads, do, how do you feel about uh, Jason stands against the other Robins in terms of characterization? Do you love him, despise him, or something in between? Um, I love him as Red Hood. I, I, I really, really love him as Red Hood. Um, as a character, there's just there's something really, really fascinating there. Um, and as far as, you know, ranking the mainline Robins go, he's like my number two right behind Dick. Um, just a really, really interesting character. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot to tap into especially when it comes to jason's psyche and um but if you're talking about his characterization compared to the others as robin he's probably one of the most vanilla robins just as robin at least in my opinion um because he 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 reads mostly like the reason he was created which was just the dick grayson replacement um up until like post crisis when we actually gave him a, a backstory of his own and um and really started making him a bit more of a character you know not long before he died um I, I even then was... they clearly didn't know what to do with him so they decided let's let's tr- let's let the public decide if we want to kill him off yep which so is there's a shame. That. yeah yeah uh, but I guess that about does it for questions that we got for this yes. episode. And I don't think we have anything else to cover in non-spoilers. I think no, we should uh, just dive right into spoilers. Well, right? I mean, before we go into spoiler territory, as always, if you'd like to purchase this book before before we move on to spoilers, there will be a link in the description of this video slash audio. And if you'd <laughs> like to find out what we're doing next yeah. time, <laughs> um, I'll, go say, to the I'll end say this. Of go to the end of the episode. I will say for the next episode, Jacob does already know what it is. I sadly do. Um, in fact, Jacob will be the one announcing what our next episode I is at the this. end of this episode. I'm so excited. <laughs> Um, for those of you curious, as a little tease before you, before you either skip to the end of the episode or go we're into our spoiler section, um, Jacob Jacob knew ahead of time that episode 30 was a celebration in multiple ways. First off, because, you know, we're, we're 30 episodes into the podcast. We're coming up soon. Um, so uh, so I wanted to choose something specifically for the first time ever. Now, keep in mind, Jacob can dislike any book that we choose for the podcast. But with this one in particular, I wanted to choose something specifically because it was bad. And, and that is all I'll say. Um, stick around to the end of the episode to find out what our next one is. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm not. I'm terrified. It's it's going to be great. So without further ado, let's get into our spoiler section. Uh, moving into our first issue here, uh, Batman number 635. First off, the first uh, what seven issues of this collection have covers drawn by one Matt Wagner. Yes. And um, they're fucking beautiful. I love them so, so much. Yeah, they're all in this nice style. I, I love how... One thing I will say, so the first four issues are built around the idea that nobody knows who they're, who's under the Red Hood. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the, the story arc title is is Under the Hood. It's... Um, and I, I, I love the way even the cover is just setting up that mystery. Like... Like mm-hmm. oh yeah, where, where where it's literally drawn as the Joker Red Hood. Yeah, and I mean clearly it's evoking a flashback to Batman and, and think, the Joker being. I think created. my favorite thing, my favorite thing about these covers, uh, the Matt Wagner ones, are that they almost feel like Batman the Animated Series, don't they? Yeah, they feel they're, almost yeah, they're, almost they're like, drawn very much like that. They're they're almost really like the nice. title cards too. Like, yeah, oh definitely, specifically. yeah, mm, uh, yeah, so great. But uh, but yeah, so I guess. Uh, let's get right into this. Uh, also, um, for those of you that like that don't know much about the story, because I know a lot of people listen to the spoiler section not knowing the actual story. Um, so this is a, so this, it's a fourteen issue collection. It's split up into five smaller story arcs and an annual at the end. So six stories all together. Um, this first one in particular, like you said, is four issues. Um, but the collected edition treats it all as like one big thing. It's like chapter yeah. one, two, three, four. And the only thing that it separates really is the annual. Yes. And I, and I mean, that's because the annual is the annual. Um, mm-hmm. And I think was was probably written after the story was done. Mm-hmm. Um um but yeah so um so anyway so we open up the issue um we, we focus on this character named uh, david tipper Coates, um who's just sitting here on the side of the street and um and we talk about like, like, like things that he's seen in gotham things that he's observed and uh and tonight he's observing the battle between batman and the red hood um it's just it's, it's a cool little way to open the issue i, I yeah. really like after that. as blood drips on him uh, mm-hmm. and this is you know under the hood part one new business 
Uh, so it's written by Judd Winnick, and the 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 art in this first arc, and for a fair few of the issues, most of um, most of the art, except like the annual and like two issues, is Doug Mank. Uh, Doug Mank, yes, and Doug Mank, I think you knew ahead of time, was like one of my favorite DC yes. comics artists. Like I I love him so much. Um, he has this great run on on Green Lantern in the New Fifty Two, and like that's where I first like fell in love with his art. And he does some great work. But here, I remember you specifically called out that um the thing you were loving about the art were the inks by uh by Tom yes Dwayne Dwayne. Thank you. Um, but yeah, um, so uh, I, I remember you said like the inks like is really what like made the art shine to you. I mean, look at this first two page spread, right? Just look at the way that it's inked. Uh, how uh, you know Red Hood's silhouette is 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 really really bold, and it stands out really nicely against the background and Batman. Like, and that's just a consistent like inking style that goes really well with the art. It also helps. I don't think I mentioned it anywhere in my notes, but the colors are pretty much all Alex Sinclair once yeah, again. Yeah. So um, it, it, Doug Mank is another one of those artists that works a lot with Alex Sinclair, and it, it gives it all, almost this Jim Lee esque look to it. I think. I mean, I think Alex Sinclair is is, is at least fifty percent responsible for for Jim Lee's art being Jim Lee's art, um, at least modern Jim Lee. I don't know yeah, about yeah. older Jim Lee because. Mm-hmm. At, at least, at least lot. hush onwards, you know? Yes. Uh, but, uh, so, interestingly, now, again, anybody reading this today, nobody's going to be surprised by the identity of the Red Hood at all. Um, but here, we, we start the mystery of the Red Hood with, the, with these three little uh, thought bubbles from, from Batman, saying he likes to talk, it's not ego, it's distraction, as he's fighting this guy. And um, so so we already get the feel that, like, that, that the Red Hood is, is a character, and, and someone underneath that hood is, is someone that knows what will work in well when it comes to fighting bruce wayne um he immediately cuts through bruce's belt and armor so mm-hmm. automatically we have high stakes and we're mm-hmm. in media res i wasn't expecting to be opening in media res i probably mm-hmm. should have it's 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 a fairly obvious thing to do yeah and interestingly this flash forward here doesn't come up until the end of the second arc in this collection yes so clearly it was this was all meant to be at least one big story and you can tell um like and, and that's not meant to be like a bad thing it's just you, you can tell this this was this was written to be a big long epic tale um and I think I think the way it's set up is a really good setup mm-hmm. um and uh so so um so this fight is happening um uh, somewhere in the process of all this, the Red Hood rips off Batman's mask, and and Bruce almost doesn't react to this because you know, like, Bruce at least realizes you know that like this character already knows who he is. Um, and so, uh, so the Red Hood says, "Look at you, I got, uh, I guess, I guess we should keep it even." And he takes off his hood and puts the hood down, and Bruce says, "Oh God!" And then we finish our flash forward um, five weeks earlier. Five weeks earlier, and um, and we sort of catch any new readers up on uh, on where we're at right now with the with the Bat Family at the yes. moment, now, which is I important think, for you, of course. <laughs> I, I think I think it might be Alfred that we switched to Alfred narrating, mm-hmm. um, which I think is really important because Alfred ends up narrating a lot of this arc, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and you'll see it more later. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, um, th- this this narration from Alfred almost reminds me of. Um, that uh, that extra little story at the beginning of Hush, and th- this book, you know, a big part of it is following up on a big plot line from Hush that we talked about there, and that is that Jason's body is missing from its grave. Um, so, so you know, the the, the Clayface image uh, of, of Jason Todd that fought Bruce back in Hush, um, there there is more to it. Jason is ac- Jason's body is actually missing, and um, Bruce hasn't really thought about it much since. Um, but here, here we're bringing that back. Yeah. Um, and, so, and so I, I think, like you know, so, some of the scenes of this are sort of not directly referencing Hush, but but are meant to evoke Hush imagery. I feel evoke Hush imagery and evoke specifically evoke the idea of family and losing family because. Well, you know, the, this entire thing is we've lost Stephanie Brown. We have our literal one appearance in this um, in this entire story, uh, all mainly through this narration of Barbara Gordon, Tim Drake, and Cassandra Kane. Like Bruce has pushed his basically his entire family away. 
Mm. Um, and while I was slightly disappointed there wasn't more Tim content, I thought, like, I really hope that they at, they at least give Jason and Tim something in the immediate, like, like not necessarily just the Batman title, but just its immediate titles following this that Tim's in. Mm. Um, it's It's interesting because not long after this, they didn't really focus on the fact that Jason Todd was back at all. Um, really? I mean... Yeah, no, well, I mean, I mean, you already know, like, like Grant Morrison... Because of Damien. Over. Yeah, Grant Morrison took over at, at that point. Yeah, you and think Grant Morrison might even wasn't, wasn't really I interested know. in doing much at all with Jason. So if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, and I don't think there were any other Jason Todd appearances in between, I think his next one would have been Battle for the Cal. I'm surprised it didn't, he didn't show up in, like... Because I know Tim had his own Robin series that went from, like the 90s pretty much all the way up to where the new 52 started yeah um well that was replaced by a, a title called red robin towards the end there it okay. ran for it ran for like two years i think um yeah so there so was that yeah that's surprising because just just playing those characters off each other sounds like and it seems really interesting especially with what hush set up mm-hmm. um, i mean battle for the cow is a big bat family event you know minus bruce of course um yes I, I, but, and uh, i expect we'll read that someday yeah I definitely it, it's, despite not being written by grant morrison and not really being essential for the grant morrison run um i, I always consider it you know ah, as, so, as, so, as much so, as much a so when we do the morrison stuff we will be reading battle for the cowl very probably although it's tony daniels because and, and we like tony daniel he's yes, good yes um both anyway, writing so we'll get it right wow, and drawing <laughs> Wow, we Sorry, on a this is, holy this shit. This is going to be one of those episodes, I think, Joey, just because... It's going to be such a long episode. Oh, my God. We're only half an hour in. I mean, we're already half an hour in. Right. Yes. Jesus. Um, um, but anyway. yeah, we established that Lucius has been trying... Lucius Fox has been trying to reach Bruce and uh, is has just shown up at Wayne Manor and refuses to take no for an answer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am guessing Lucius doesn't know Bruce's Batman, at least at this point. Um, um I don't know. I'm mm. I mean it imply it, it implies him because um Alfred says, I tried that, sir. He tracked her down and apparently she's in Miami with a professional hockey player. Implying, you know, uh it's like, oh tell tell him I'm out, tell him you think I'm with that Russian tennis player I'm supposedly seeing. And then, well, he you know, she's in Miami, so uh, yeah. so I don't think he knows. Uh, it's it's odd. I don't, you know, I actually don't have no clue at this point. So um, I don't know. L- 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 Lucius's larger role in the Bat Family um doesn't really come into play, in my opinion, until like a, a more modern comic, um, which is so weird to me. Calling Under the Red Hood a not modern comic. <laughs> I mean, it's it's nearly <laughs> it's getting close to being two decades old at this point. Oh God, don't say that. Um, anyway, <laughs> so um. <laughs> So Bruce goes to see Lucius, um, and, uh, and, and go ahead. Sorry, uh, we have we have this great little, just this great little seed um, of partially wider world building that Cord, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Cord Industries, which is t- handles research and development for Wayne Tech, uh, had a hostile takeover, um, and Bruce has been removed from the board of directors. Uh, so. You know, everything is wiped out. And one, this just further isolates Bruce um, on top of his self-isolation. Um, and, you know, we go back to Bruce in the cave suiting up as Batman. And he basically, he's basically lying to tell himself that it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I think, um, one, just just... This feels like it's you, you can just feel the grief in every page, right? Oh yeah, yeah. like and so, Bruce just actively pushing Alfred out of the way. You know, Alfred pretty much being the only person that has stuck around at this point. Um, you know, other than the ones that are already out of Gotham. You know, some someone like Dick. Um, yeah. But so anyway, Bruce leaves. Um, we go over to this meeting of a couple mob heads, um, and they realize and... that that nobody there actually set up the meeting. They were all told to meet here, and they don't know by who. Um, and suddenly. AK-47 shots right onto the table, and Jason Todd swans into the, into the scene. Hey, 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 the Red Hood. The Red Hood swans Red onto Hood. the scene, just as this amazing smartass 
with some amazing lines. Oh, oh yeah, like like, like the the one mob boss goes, "You want to die? This is your way to kill yourself." And Red Hood goes, "Yeah, like, like yelling at the guy holding the AK-47." You know. <laughs> um, uh, also, I've seen the animated film so many times. Like, just all of these lines are Jensen Ackles. You know? <laughs> he, pl- he plays the role so perfectly. He does it so perfectly, uh, and yeah. it's it's great. I'm surprised. I'm surprised they haven't gotten him back as Red Hood at all in any he other projects. did get projects. him to play Batman once, though. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, soon to be twice, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it really? I think they've confirmed that he's doing it in like a future animated oh, is, project. Is he, is, he doing that in, uh, is he doing that in Justice League War World? I think so. Okay, cool. Yeah, so he's okay. in this in the current animated universe that they're building. It's, J- it's, it's Jensen Ackles. Mm-hmm. I mean, so. Troy Baker's great too. Troy Baker does Jason in the Arkham series, and he's great, of course. But uh, but it's Jensen Ackles for him. Anyway, um, so Red Hood drops this bag down uh, down at the table uh, in the middle of all these mobsters, and um, it's a duffel bag full of the, the heads of all their l- lieutenants. Uh, he says that that took me two hours. You want to see what I could do in a whole evening? Um, and so he's basically, both... it just just comes in and says, "Hey, they all work for me. You know, you all work for me now." And he uh, he, he gives them a better out. deal than the Black Mask has apparently been giving them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we meet the man himself. We meet the Black Mask. Um, I was surprised at how funny the Black Mask is. He is so funny. Like he is such a great source of comedic relief while also being like genuinely threatening at the same time. Yeah, like, um, he's, he's, yeah, he's terrifying, great. but like we meet him in a limo drinking like whiskey or something mm-hmm. um respond you know this isn't like still where there's smoke there's fire no where there's fire there's fire and at the moment i have all the gasoline um, um and and once again not to keep bringing up the animated film throughout this but again wade williams is the voice for this specific black mask because that sarcastic black mask is is just played perfectly by wade williams and also on the animated film one of the best creative decisions that whole film makes is gender bending lee Yes. Like I, <laughs> I just I, Lee just works better as a woman. I just I don't know why it just it just makes sense. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, so Black Mask and his his uh, his his right hand Lee they go, they go to see um, they go to see one of their um, or someone someone that they're gonna be uh, gonna start working with. This person is revealed in the final page cliffhanger to be Mister Freeze. Freeze. Um, <laughs> and that was a surprise, just because like. I didn't think Mr. Freeze was in this story, but here we are. There he is. Um, We open up the second issue here, Batman 636. Um, Another great cover by by Matt Wagner. I just, I love the way he does everything. It's just, it's another great cover. Well, the covers also do a really good job of foreshadowing each issue, at least the Wagner covers. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, the Jock ones in the end do too, but... Yeah, um, yeah. These are the, at least for especially with these first four, they're a lot more explicit. Um, like the mm-hmm. first one was setting up the fact that you know Batman and the Red Hood are going to come to blows. Now this one's setting our sights right as at, right at Batman versus the Black Mask because we're an issue in. Batman doesn't know the Red Hood's a, a, a character yet. Um, yeah, yeah. Like it, it, it takes it, it takes its time, and I think that's smart. But. Uh, this issue is called First Strike. Um, we open with Batman investigating the fact um, with some with some drug dealers. Yeah. Um, um, he does some more inner monologuing, talking about how isolated he is anymore at the perfect time, because who should enter the scene but one Dick Grayson, a.k.a. Nightwing, and... Um, and he just comes up with this, this, this wonderful just joy that Dick Grayson always enters every scene with. Um, it, it, just, it, my note said... Finally, some humor, <laughs> like some outright just corny humor. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, uh, like one of my favorite lines. I don't know what's worse: the fact that we're making small talk about the weather, or the fact that you could turn it into a di- turn a turn on turn it on a dime into crime fighting. <laughs> Uh, and it's so good. I just, I don't know. I just, I, I mean, I love Dick Grayson, obviously, and I love that he's here. And also, just a great character to have here. And you don't quite realize the significance he has here until he's gone from the story. Because yeah. the same issue that the, his last appearance in this story is the issue where Jason's revealed. Um, yes. Is, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's great. Great. I, I also think it's just especially great. Bruce is still trying to push him away, but Dick's just like, no, I'm here. I'm going to help you find these drug dealers and find, you know, what, what this, how the power dynamic is shifting. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, 
And one of my favorite little jokes here at the end of the scene is um, uh, Bruce goes, uh, I'm, I'm working a case. If you want to stay, I won't stop you. Dick, grow, Dick goes, the warmth is overwhelming. <laughs> to which Bruce says, unseasonably so. And as they're swinging away, Dick's like, oh, good God, a joke. <laughs> he made a joke. It's just, it's just, it's great. I just, I love the dynamic. Um, what also, totally I, I, love, I, I love this version of the Nightwing suit with, oh, yeah. like. The, the early the, 2000s Nightwing suit is perfect. Well, I. I it's this tiny detail, but the blue going all the way down to the fingertips. Yeah, um, yeah, it's nice. Like I- I've seen some art from like the current Nightwing run, and they they have that back on the suit. And I just it, I don't know why. I think it's just nice. Like, it's just really. I, nice. I think that's like the best part, the best version of the suit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, Mister Freeze uh, is being suited up with some new technology yes Uh, someone assigned by black mask um and uh and as he's working on this uh lee goes in to see uh black mask uh and just i don't know again just i love just black mask kind of dry humor throughout this it's just fun it's really fun he's informed Um, that there's a new player the red hood which black mask says very nostalgic Uh, mm -hmm. are you worried no that's what i have you for and besides i'm slightly ahead of your intel and he's basically accessing security cameras throughout Gotham because he pretty much owns most of crime in Gotham at this point, mm-hmm. if not all. Um, and so then they're informed uh, that uh, there's another another issue with Mr. Freeze and Lee's like, what now? And he's killed another lab tech to which Black Mask replies, Spunky, I like that. Get him another lab tech. Get him another <laughs> it's lab just, tech. It's just fun. He's really, really fun. Um, and uh, as this is all happening, uh, Red Hood is watching uh watching over this um this deal that's going down by the docks um, and, a, and, a, and a shipment of a mysterious a, a bunch of a bunch of cake, crates and things but one that's suspiciously large mm-hmm. um and you know they're armed guards with very heavy duty armor mm-hmm. and bruce swoops in and yep. starts taking them out and so does uh, Dick, and they they just they work really well together. I like the inner monologue here um, from Bruce here. He goes, uh, I think about when he was younger, when I was younger. It was a different time, simpler, and I miss it. I miss those days. For that, it's hard to be around him. And we just, um, yeah, there's just this one panel where, my God, Bruce Wayne is smiling. Yeah, just, oh, it's uh, so good. So, so good. Um, so they start to investigate the, the shipment that came in, um... After they've taken out all these guys, uh, they look through like these weapons that were that were coming in. We have some uh, some some Joker bombs uh, that that were there, and um, and this one uh, this one piece of equipment inside one of the boxes starts to um starts to sort of like buzz, and then it blows up, and they uh, Bruce and Dick uh, escape from there. Then they see that there's somebody up on the roof, and that is of course the elusive Red Hood. They start running after him, and uh, and you really see here like you know we hadn't really seen up to this point like Red Hood being as um agile as he is here i think you know like he he's he's a he's a very clear match for both dick and bruce um i mean at this point in in bruce's monologue where something clicks uh Mm -hmm. like the penny hasn't dropped but it's now in the air he's now slowly making that connection yeah Uh, um and uh there's this really key bit here where um, where bruce throws a rope at jason uh, at red hood's leg um and and pretty much like before it's even fully wrapped around him like uh, red hood cuts the wire and um and uh, and, and, and escapes pretty easily from there yes. um he he jumps he jumps through this window um bruce and dick immediately follow red hood's already gone they're inside there and they're left in there with um with an android called amazo, amazo. uh were you familiar with amazo at all i wasn't you had mentioned him before okay but i hadn't like you you mentioned him and what his deal with is like he you know has all the powers of the justice league mm-hmm. um so <sighs> It's uh, my note here was this feels like it's going Silver Age, which a little not bit. the last time it kind of <laughs> does that. Um, yeah, yeah. There, there's a bit towards the end where like, yeah, it does that far that more, far more than the Amazon. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. I like campy weirdness, um, especially here. Um, yeah. And it works. Yeah, it works so well because we, um, they, they, they do it in the film. So we move on. To... Uh, Batman 637, um, another great cover. Just I, lo- I I really can't express enough how much I love the Matt Wagner covers. Um, I love the way he draws Dick here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we go into chapter three of Under the Hood, Overnight Deliveries. Um, 
we see a uh, black mask talking to Mr. Freeze again. This guy sort of like steps in for black mask and freeze kills him immediately. Um, which black mask, once again, just great lines. Uh, I get it. You're unpredictable. I can work with work that. with that. <laughs> just nothing is phasing this man. And yeah. surprisingly you think, Oh, we're, we're, we're setting up a slow downfall of the black mask. And like, kind of, but also not really like, mm-hmm. like by the end of this, he still has pretty much all of his power. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's just been shaken up a bit, which is. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Red Hood feels like the bigger threat after this first arc is over. Um, yes. Simply because of who he is. But really, it's just another person for Black Mass to take off the board. Yes, which I, um, which I, which, which, which I, I love. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And it, it really helps the mystery of who is Red Hood. Yeah. Because. I imagine this was an actual mystery, at least mm-hmm. when it was com- at least when it was coming out, like yeah, yeah. month I mean, to month. I mean, also to, something to keep in mind, and you know, like if you're reading this story isolated, you know, you 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 don't really realize that uh, that Hush had already basically set up what this story is working off of, you know, and and if you just like cast your mind back, because what the story came out almost two years after Hush, and it, um, it, it pretty much started like. And right at the tail end of 2004, so... Yeah. And yeah, so... About uh, two years. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you just catch your mind back to that one story, you know? And, and, and the answer is right there, you know? Because they set up the Jason Return so well in that. Um, yes. And it's just it's just bringing that back around here. So, anyway, um, th- this, this issue is basically a giant fight sequence. Because Amazo is a character with all the powers of the Justice League. He has absorbed all these pow- powerful metahumans, um, uh, super abilities, and he's fighting Dick Grayson and Bruce Wayne. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's uh, fun. It, it, it's a fun power dynamic, and uh, it makes for a really interesting fight. Um, especially, I think what it really what, what the fight does really well is further flesh out the Bruce and Dick dynamic and how Dick is clearly trying to save Bruce from himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But it and also working. just... And also, it's just so much fun to see how well they work together, you know. Um, there, there are a lot of great moments, specifically towards the end of the fight, where, you know, they, they just they get into that groove together, you know, and it's like they're just Batman and Robin again. Yes, which is, you know, obviously intentional because of what this story is. Um, and I, I love that Dick just shoves... Um, I don't know if they're his, like, escrimis sticks, but they're... Into into amazing years and just shocks his brain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but not not a, not enough so that you know the fight keeps going and it it builds it's, it builds it's a very very good fight. Mm-hmm. Also, I think this is where Manx art like in the action. This is where Manx art shines. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't so. really comment on it last issue, but like uh, Red Hood doing flips off buildings, Dick doing all of his acrobatics. It's just let this happen like yeah, let, yeah. Like, this this man is a great artist for that um mm-hmm. um so amazo has all these all these great abilities we see like super strength flight whatever he uses uh superman's heat vision at one point starts attacking them with it which i don't know why he wasn't using that from the start um but uh there's this great little moment after that where like uh uh, Bruce comes around and like puts like this putty over over his eyes yes. and um, <laughs> plastic and explosives mm-hmm. and blows up his eyes yeah um, um and so he can't use heat vision um the fight continues it's again it's just it's just a cool little fight sequence that's the most of his uses missiles to 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 throw him into gotham harbor and blow him up yeah um, and uh and that is the end of that so um dick and bruce go off together and then black mask is informed of what happened to amazo um meanwhile we get a call from uh uh, from Red Hood. Red Hood just is casually on the phone with Black Mask. And, I, I uh, love I love this line. Hello, do you prefer I, I call you Black Mask, Mr. Mask, Blackie? Um, <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's it's fun. It's just really, really fun. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so Red Hood says, like, I have, like, your shipment that you're, that you're supposed to receive tonight. Um, specifically, I have a crate that you think, that I think you might be really interested in, you know, um, uh yeah and uh black mask is like well which crate he's like well i don't have the manifest number but i can tell you, you. the box is filled with what with over 100 pounds of kryptonite <laughs> and the last line from black mask is yeah i'm gonna need that <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah. it's just hilarious like i don't 
I wasn't expecting it to be this funny. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we go into the final issue of the Under the Under the Hood story. Um, Batman 638 with probably the best cover of these first yes. couple. Um, and there's a really nice variant cover of this at the end of the book. Um, I yes, I, I think that was like the second printing or so- cover. Um, yeah, because because yeah. it's uh, well, as you'll see, this is a a pretty key issue. <laughs> this is um, this is that one, yeah. Um, but yeah. So um, we open, uh, you know, with this this nice this nice sort of monologue about currency and value, um, mm-hmm. and and money and how how power happens and how power in the DC universe because of things like kryptonite has shifted. Uh, mm. uh, and so the value of, of having, you know, even just a small piece of kryptonite is, is pretty important. Having over a hundred pounds of it is obviously even more important. Um, so then we go right into um, uh, Dick and Bruce following up on the investigation. Um, the searching the warehouses. Out. Yep. Trying to find out where everything is. And they realize that there's a, a, a crate missing. Obviously it's the crate that, that Red Hood has. Um, Interestingly, and, when they when they when we go back to Red Hood with the creative kryptonite this time, it's not all green kryptonite. There there are different colors mixed in there too. Yes, which is, which I don't I don't know if you know anything about different colored kryptonites. Do you? Um, I I know that they exist. I don't. I couldn't tell you what like most of them do, mm-hmm. except for the pink one because of that goddamn joke. <laughs> um, but yeah. So okay. So you know that they all do like different things. Different right? things. Like I know yeah. one of them doesn't one of them neutralize Superman's powers completely. Yeah, uh, yeah, they, yeah. They all do something different. Um, I, I I love Black Kryptonite personally, mostly because of how it's used in uh, a Grant Morrison story. But um, but yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, so we go uh, we go into here um, once again. Red Hood is is uh, negotiating with Black Mask, trying to get like the money wired to him. Uh, just just you know, so Black Mask could still have the Kryptonite, and instead they settle on. I, I, I love somewhere. I love this exchange. I don't want to work for you. What do you want? A tremendous amount of money. How much? Fifty million dollars. Fifty. What are you trying to budget a movie? Um, and it's and, uh, uh, there, there's also just this this respect between the two characters. Like Black Masks respects the Red Hood, yeah, because he knows yeah. what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Jason is going to to sell the the the, uh, the kryptonite. Uh, you know, uh, it's like oh, you know. Um, and and they they work out a deal. Uh, they say that they're they're gonna, they're gonna like meet somewhere instead for it. Red Hood says the the meet location, and uh, what Black Mask obviously intends to do is just to kill Red Hood on the spot. So he sends Mister Freeze out with him and um, and a couple other Black Mask's men. And yeah. lovely, what a day! Yeah. I woke up in such a great mood. Um, which is just it's the comedy is there and it works yeah. so well. Um. Uh, Meanwhile, Dick and Bruce are, uh, are 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 driving in the Batmobile together, and again, just their their banter is great. They have a lot of fun lines together. Um, and uh, Dick is going there's... to suggest trying to bring in Oracle, um, which Bruce immediately shuts down. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and Bruce is like, you know, we came to rely on her for too much. I guess we don't have to worry about that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're following the radiation trail. They lead it, you know, to a warehouse um, where, you know, Freeze and Black, Black Masks ma- men um, are, are there just to kill him. Jason is, like, up on the pipes with two big-ass guns ready just to shoot them down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, of course, a gunfight ensues. And yeah. it doesn't take long. For Jason to well, for Red Hood. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, he he wastes pretty much everyone except for Mister Freeze because Mister Freeze has like this protective armor on. Um, so as he's there with Mister Freeze, uh, Batman and, and Nightwing arrive, and uh, there's this great little moment between Red Hood and Nightwing, um, and uh, it's just uh, it, it's just you know without knowing who the characters are, you know, you don't realize the significance of it, but that significance is coming very soon. So. Um, uh, I like this bit here where Mr. Freeze literally uses his gun as like a as like a jet to like fly out of there. To fly out of there, yeah. It's just a really funny moment. Um, but yeah, uh, Red Hood escapes, and uh, and 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 Nightwing and Batman are left alone. Um, just 
and, and you know just deciding to themselves like oh yeah that red hood like, you know, he's not just another gangster he's someone really good um good. and then we, and then the we have the epilogue <laughs> and in the issue on this scene we're at this i'm, I'm assuming like run down amusement park carnival type thing and yeah. uh um, and we see a, a sort of almost drunken Joker, um, someone who's just like, you know, just just hanging around there, doesn't, you know, doesn't really know what's going on. And uh, Red Hood approaches the Joker. Joker With a crowbar. Says, uh, Joker says, um, uh, tell me who you are or I'll kill you. You think I'm kidding? And Red Hood says, no, I'd never think that. And Red Hood starts beating the piss out of Joker with a crowbar. And there's this great, like, six-panel page that almost sort of evokes the imagery oh, it, of Death it, it in is, the Family. It is intentionally lay, laid out the same way Death in the Family is. Like, this is... <laughs> if you're not... If, if you haven't made the connection yet... Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so Joker's beaten... To, uh, beaten to a pulp on the floor, and Jason Jason taking off his Red Hood mask, revealing Jason Todd, says, tell me, how does that feel? Yeah. And that ends off under the hood. We go into our second arc, which is... I can't remember what it's called. Family uh, Reunion. There. Yeah, Family Reunion. Um, we go into uh, Batman 639, a very Batman the Animated Series cover here. Um, also... I keep bringing up Batman the Animated Series, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that this is the first episode, episode. we're recording since uh, since the death of Kevin Conroy. Well, we do have a, a tribute in the works, uh, hopefully yes. coming in. Uh, Which I think I think you're just future. about done with, right? Uh, getting close to being done. With. Yes, uh, it, it's a bonus episode. We're planning a bonus episode on a big Kevin Conroy Batman thing. So yes, it's just yeah. it's um, just taking a little bit of time. Yeah. Um, um as always just kevin connery is the batman you know even as we talk about this story kevin connery is the voice that we all hear in our he always heads. will be um, um, and I don't, I don't think anyone will ever do for the role of batman quite quite as much as i kevin mean connery he was basically the first one to do two voices as batman and bruce wayne essentially mm. uh and yeah he's he's perfect he, he and he always will be yes. so so 639 mm. 639, yes. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I just love that cover. Just him, like, kneeling in front of the grave. Yes. Anyway. Um, uh, we open with two uh, drug dealers riding down Miller Avenue. I am not amused. <laughs> you should be amused. Come on. I mean, I understand why you're not amused specifically right you now. You know why I'm not <laughs> amused. I'm so excited. I love it. Mm, it's so great. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, so this, this van of, of drug dealers gets blown up by Red Hood, and... You brought up this interesting thing as you were reading this, and you messaged me, and you were like, there's this interesting change here, because Red Hood isn't acting any different, but the scenes feel different, because now we know that he's Jason. We, they, they, yeah, they feel different. There's also something interesting that I, that we were remiss to mention in, in Red Hood's introduction scene, um, that specifically because... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Jason, right. Jason has a code. Essentially, mm. you know... Give, give him forty percent of the cut. Yeah, and do do whatever you want on the streets. You know, do whatever you would do. You you'll be working for me, on one condition: don't deal to kids. Don't don't involve kids in any way. And I love that little touch there because it, it, it's 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 that's it's, how Jason grew up. You know, J- it's, it's Jason's life important. was ruined by these things. It's also just very important in setting up that Jason, despite all of the shit, the the multiple murders. He's not too far gone. Yeah, well, he's pretty far gone. He's but pretty far. But, but, but what's interesting is Jason still has that moral compass. Yes. And I think that moral compass can be dragged back with enough work and time and storytelling potential that I don't know if it happens. Probably not. Um, <laughs> um, you, you know what? I give Red Hood and the Outlaws a lot of shit, but a big part of that run is... Um, is is dealing with Jason's trauma and um and 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 having him actually work through that and be just a regular person again. See, 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 that's good. That's that's. I wouldn't hate. I mean, I don't want to say wouldn't hate because that's notoriously bad. And I've seen bits look, of that first look, issue. I I will always stand by. It's not completely awful because I do like the characterization of Jason. I like his friendship with Roy. But Starfire is a part of that book, and she is miserably characterized the entire way through. And when it comes to a team that is only three people, and she is one of those three people, 
it's a that's big a issue. problem yeah <laughs> it's a really big issue um but i don't completely hate it as a series and there are things to like in there well, that's that's why i'd like to cover it someday just just to see how i react in comparison to you because but anyway Wow, our tangents have been insane yeah, this episode. Sorry. My God. <laughs> Jason Todd is a fascinating character who I think people don't give enough credit for. And it would be nice if DC kept gave him an ongoing and, you know. I mean, I, I'm i not sure if it's ongoing. I think it was a mini. But Task Force Z was a thing recently. Did okay, you hear so about that at all? I, I did not. It's uh, um zombie suicide squad with Jason oh. leading the team. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. I I I I I haven't read it, but I read the the lead up to it in Detective. There were some backup stories, and um, it seems like a cool idea, you know. Oh, okay, um, interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, we go into uh, Black Mask and Lee, and they're talking about their things, and it's 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 fun. It's great. Again, I just best thing that animated film did is make Lee a woman. I don't know what it is. It just makes the character work so much better for some reason. Just yeah. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it alters the dynamic subtly yeah. and brings out some more sexual tension almost but like I don't, I don't know if it's sexual tension i just feel like it makes lee talking back to black mask all the better for some reason just, just, just a little bit though like, because it's... black mask i nothing about his about his dialogue says sexist but just the way he acts says sexist and I yeah think having that character there in the film makes it work you know work yeah. Anyway, uh, meanwhile, Bruce has a hunch. <laughs> Bruce has um, a hunch. And it is a minor complaint I have about this story, is that there are, there are some conclusions that Bruce reaches here that do seem to come out of nowhere, just yeah, a little like, bit. We, we've shifted to the penny has dropped when it shouldn't yeah. have dropped. And, now, and, I, now, I, now, keep, now, keep in mind, there are a lot of dead Bat family members, and Bruce could think it's literally anyone, but all he all he has put together, really, is that Red Hood is someone that knows the way he fights. Yes. Um, it's, 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 <laughs> I mean, it's clearly not Stephanie. She just died. So it's a uh, bit of a stretch for Bruce to come to Zatanna and say, hey, let's check out one of the Lazarus pits that have been shut down by me and uh, and see if it's still really shut down. Ow. And uh, I was very happy to see Zatanna just as a character. Right. Wasn't just, expecting it. Yeah, just a great. I mean, there are a lot of great little appearances, such as our next one with uh, uh, Jason Blood, a.k.a. Jason Blood. Etrigan the Demon. Um, and it's just it's just great to see him there. And uh and, and and basically what's just happening here is Bruce just wants to know, hey, if there's a way to just straight up resurrect somebody, how would that happen? You know, because um, he's like, because because for Bruce, he's like, I've seen that happen before. You know, a lot of my friends have died and come back to life. <laughs> um, let's 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 look into that. And um, and also, I think actually. I should probably mention this. And, and while I may say it's a bit of a stretch for Bruce to jump to like, hey, how would resurrection work for someone that I know? Um, there is also the fact that Bruce does know that Jason's grave is empty. Yeah. So. So there's that. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so uh, after that, we, we we catch up with Onyx. And Onyx is a character I know you have no clue who no. she is. Now, luckily, the collection does give you, does have a cast of characters page. Mm -hmm. um which gives onyx a, a little bit of a backstory yeah um, yeah it, it tells you enough to just say like okay yes. who's this character let's get into it you know what actually it reminds me of it's like if somebody was watching the under the red hood film for the first time and had no clue who nightwing was there's yeah. just that there's just that perfect little moment where those two thugs are like oh he was the first robin and he, and he went off and became nightwing and it's like okay that makes sense that's that's perfect you know that's, that's all perfect. you need to know let's get right into especially it especially since Oddly enough, only recently, I think the general public has become aware of, like, Nightwing as... Well, especially because, what, the film came out in, like, 2008, 2009, somewhere around I think there. it was, like, 2010. 2010, so, was... yeah, okay, somewhere around there. But, like, you know, like, De Nightwing was definitely not, like, a general audience knowledge character, you know? Um, his yeah. only big thing that he had appeared in up to that point was New Batman Adventures, I'd say. Um, yeah, New Batman Adventures. And that's uh, about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, even and, then, like, Dick, Dick Grayson was still just Robin, even at the time, because of the Teen Titans show, you know? Yes. 
Um, so yeah, yeah so, it's, so you know, it's great to have little moments like that. And, you know, just to get that quick crash course, let's get right into it. You know, this is who Onyx is. Let's yes. let's jump into that. And we see her take down this these um these a uh, couple of like goons here that are just having this little meetup. And yeah. uh, and they're they're all drug dealers. She's mm-hmm. trying to get information. Uh, what's interesting is that Batman allows her to work on the streets. Also, um, it annoys me, but like, there's a typo here. Uh, and which Just panel? Uh, the last page that Onyx appears on in this scene. Uh, top right panel. The guy, a guy screams, "Ah, you're breaking my fucking arm, you lousy!" And then, but it says "your," as in like, not the, not the, oh, not yeah. the, not yeah, you are. Is... Just, I don't know. I feel like letterers should catch on to these things, you know? Yeah, like, <laughs> if not letterers, then, hey, there's an editor on this book. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just, just a stupid little nitpick. <laughs> um, yeah, fucking uh, Ken Lopez, you bitch. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Watch so, Ken Lopez be responsible for, like, some of the best Batman stories or something. Yeah anyway so um so then we catch up with oliver queen the green arrow and it's always just great to see him show up in something I, but, but i love this scene I mean, this scene so so what's fascinating is we've entered a decent stretch of of the story that's basically cut wholesale from the film um mm. which i think is a smart decision for a film oh yeah i mean like like there's even that whole thing where like during the amazo scene you know they don't call out any of the specific meta humans whose powers that amazo has it's just you know let's make it simple let's make it just strictly a batman world for the film let's let, let's, let's streamline let's, things yeah so if you just threw in characters like satana and, and etrigan and green arrow you know like it'd be it it would just not that, not that I'm saying it wouldn't work, but you'd certainly have a lot more heavy lifting to do in an hour yeah. and fifteen minute film, you know. Yeah, and and the film does just a good job of understanding the emotional through line of these middle issues and giving it giving that emotional through line to other characters and mm-hmm. altering things enough that but yeah. It works. But but this here, this is one of my favorite scenes in the whole comic. Like I I really love this. Um, just Batman is at this point just says to Oliver, "Hey, like you you died and you came back to life fairly recently." Um, he says, "You weren't involved with any aspect of the occult before you died. Were you were you prepared for death?" And Oliver goes, "Like prepared? No, I was I was blown up on a plane. I didn't exactly have time to pack a lunch, you know." Um, and he goes, "What did you think I kept something from you?" And Batman goes, "Why would I think that? Haven't you always been truthful with me?" And you just get this immediate feeling of distrust between yeah, Bruce this, and Ollie. This interesting you know? distrust, which I think might help tie in with the fact that this is also inching closer to Infinite Crisis happening. Like mm-hmm. in terms of publication, and uh, so um, so Batman says, uh, um, uh, I just don't know where it comes from, Oliver, and where does what where what comes from? Bruce says, this anger you have towards me, I know it can't be anything I've done to you. You're not that shallow, so it must be something you've done to me. I'm tired of sparring with you, and he goes away, and Oliver just says to himself, I'm sorry, and it's just this really great scene that you immediately get the dynamic between those two characters, and, it's, and it's, it's it's brilliant. It feels like there's also some twist in some other story that this this would explain right mm. like yeah i've i've not personally read it if it exists but honestly i don't need it i think it it, it, it works fine on its own but that story probably is out there somewhere yes um but bruce goes off in the bat plane he gets a uh, call from onyx, onyx. Yeah, onyx checks in says that she's been looking at these like drug dealers um she's a uh, she's a uh, she's casing this like you know uh, meeting between these dealers and um uh, she she hangs up and eventually who should show up behind her but the red hood also watching it on this uh, on this meeting and um and that's that's the end of the issue it's great another great reveal um uh, we go into Batman six forty six forty which is okay not the end of the arc <laughs> I don't know why I thought it was for some reason no nope, it's six forty one um, is the end of the arc but yeah. but Matt um, Wagner does another great cover I know I could just keep saying that but I love this one specifically with with Bruce and Clark here it's just it's really nice yes. um. um only thing I wish is that, like, you know, it, it would make the Superman reveal all the better in this issue if he wasn't on the cover. But still, it's there. Um, so this is well the cat's away. Um, we, you know, uh, a little bit of recap in, in, in the narration. Mm-hmm. While we have Onyx and Red Hood meeting each other. Um, I was like, Onyx is like, the Red Hood, very astute. What was your first clue? <laughs> 
It's great. You know, it, like like Jason's sarcasm is so great. Yeah. Sorry, Red this is the first issue not drawn by Doug Mank. This one's drawn by uh, Paul Lee uh, mm-hmm. with inks by Cam Smith. Um, There's not a huge difference, but enough that you're like, okay, this is definitely not Doug Mank. You know? no. um, um, I think I think it helps that, that Sinclair's colors keep it consistent enough that it doesn't break the illusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so meanwhile, meanwhile, um, uh, we're at this uh, this building. These these thugs break in. They start smashing up this office. Um, and in this really great sequence, we see like a couple bits where like you know this guy's like smashing uh, a a computer with a bat, and he like swings up and he swings back down, and the bat is gone. Um, Batman's grabbed it from him. This other guy comes in. He's like smashing something with a shotgun, and the guy disappears as a whole. And um, and this other person comes in and aims a gun at Batman. And, uh, and he just disappears. And we see that, like, you know, those two guys that disappeared were Superman, and he's holding them up. But you don't see any hint of Superman in those pages beforehand. It's just, I love that moment. It's really it's, good. <laughs> it's a good moment. Um, and Bruce is like, I had him. So, uh, Clark, I never had a doubt. You came <laughs> to Metropolis to have to stop and have to stop a burglary? You should have called ahead. I'd have gotten you theater tickets. <laughs> I came to talk. Um, and they're going to have a talk. Uh, meanwhile, Red Hood and Onyx are still uh, are, are still act, doing exposition about specifically these drug dealers that they're above. Mm-hmm. Um, where um, we Red... learn... Oh, go ahead. Where we have, we have some of, you know, uh, just Jason's moral code even more entrenched. Um, you know, what, like we learn one of these guys is a pimp who moved on to a kiddie porn ring before he fell in love with narcotics. Really, again, really establishing that that Jason isn't. If you're looking, if you were to wanted to give Jason Todd at this point in his characterization a D and D alignment, it probably wouldn't be like chaotic evil. Mm-hmm. It would probably be chaotic neutral or lawful evil, like. Mm-hmm. I would say lawful evil is yeah something that he could again come back on, which I think is why, as a character, I I took a shine to him throughout the story. Like Mm -hmm. you you like uh, Winnick just does a really good job of understanding who he is Mm -hmm. and who he's become. Like, and it's also not just like uh, understanding the character; like he's creating a whole new identity for Jason and absolutely nailing it. you, you really feel like, like like where he's coming from and everything that he does. Yeah. It really works. Um, and he also, but, uh, he, we'll, we'll get to it when we get to a couple of things later on. But we don't have, um, there's, there's this idea of Jason Todd being the angry and edgy Robin. Mm-hmm. And even Winnick understands he isn't. Yeah, I mean, he's, from, he's fairly edgy. <laughs> the edge comes from post-resurrection. Yeah, yeah. Like, or as... really not. I mean, we'll get into it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so anyway, so he drops a smoke bomb into this uh, into this ring of drug dealers, and he jumps down there, starts fighting them off, and um, Onyx then joins him. Uh, meanwhile, we get our scene between Batman and Superman here, and Batman's been doing what he, he's been doing this arc so far. Um He's asking around about resurrection, wants to know more about it. And specifically here, we're calling on uh, the death of Superman, which we've covered on the podcast before. And so this scene, I think, means a bit more than the other scenes that that we've had before this. Yeah, it, it hits um, harder, at least for me. And um, so, uh, so so he starts asking about his uh, his, his death, and, and Superman's like, well, I wasn't exactly dead. I was in a state that mirrored death. And Bruce goes. We don't. We, we actually don't know that. It's just uh, just that we were. T- what well, we told ourselves to make uh, make sense of it all. It was easier to fall back on that than admit the harder truth that it has nothing to do with science or logic. You were dead and you came back to life, which is an interesting take on the death of Superman. Yes. I'm curious what you make of that. Um, I think Bruce is trying to rationalize it, right? And it's it's clear that's what happened, just because. In the context of then the next three panels of dialogue from Bruce, it has been for me, I've always had the facts for every one of them we've lost, whether they thought it was about heaven or God or even magic. Magic mysticism is just another realm of science. I know that, but now I don't exactly know. And that's such an interesting aspect of this. Um, and when, especially when we bring about the actual 
way that Jason came back, despite the fact that I don't like it, it does fit into that because it is something that Bruce truly does not know anything about. And uh, and doesn't understand the possible why. Um, mm-hmm. I also... I also think it's... It's especially important because this... As far as, like, I'm aware, this is the first member of the Bat family to come back from the dead, like, post-crisis, right? Mm, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, because it's the first big Bat family death that then didn't stick, even though, well, it stuck for over a decade. But yeah, yeah. That's besides which, the point. Which is more impressive than most comic book deaths, you know? Yes. I, I think we take for granted just how rare this occasion is. <laughs> um, but yeah. Let, um, let death stick around before a, a, a while yeah. before you and, bring and it back. And to my, like, like, I want to say, like, like, when it comes to comic book deaths, I understand why nothing can be permanent, you know? Like, like yes. we, we, we cannot truly say a character is 100% dead, well, especially in the realm of comics. It's, um, it's, it's, it's like, it's because comic books like soap operas are that long-form serialized narrative that's meant they're, to they're, they're, keep they're, going. They're, they're constantly evolving stories, and they're never going to actually end. So when it comes to things like this, you cannot keep a character truly dead. So I understand why these things exist, but I think what we also have to keep in mind is that when we bring a character back, it has to be for a purpose, that we have to do something new with the character, and also, and please make the death last a little bit longer. You know? Yeah, don't... Um, I, I don't know how long the Stephanie Brown death lasted, but I imagine she... she at this point, she's not back, at least in terms of this issue, and she yeah. isn't back by the end of this story arc. That's true. Uh, Stephanie didn't change too, too much post-resurrection. <laughs> Yeah, but she still. Um, the, but bringing her back, they still gave her some time away. Like, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so Onyx and Red Hood taking out these guys. Um, they do so. They um, they get out of uh, this, or actually, they're they're being chased out of this uh, this room. They leave there. Onyx is ready to continue to fighting them off, but Red Hood pulls out this giant mini gun and uh, takes out all these other guys, kills them straight up, and then holds the gun to uh, Onyx's Onyx's throat. Um, and they have this great little, you know, uh, the great little conversation about like, you know, you know what it means to, to kill your enemies and the classic Batman moral code argument. And, um, and this great little scene where, um, where we show that Jason has truly been trained by the Bruce Wayne, um, in the, during this conversation at some point, he has, he has stuck a knife through her shoulder and she didn't even realize it. Um, and, uh, and that, that's where we sort of end the issue off. It's just, it's a great little moment. I really like that. Um, but then uh, we move into the final issue of the second arc, uh, Batman 641, beautifully mirroring the first issue of the Under the Hood arc, where instead of in, the, in those sort of like same positions, it's a close up shot of Batman fighting Jason Red Hood. And yes, um, it's just another great cover. Um, I just I'm, <laughs> as much as I love Jock as an artist, the Matt Binder covers really do like stand out more to me. But I think. I think the wagon. I, I think I think they they fit the issues that they're a part of, but like put together like this, you just you have one grouping standing out more than the other because you just you have to, mm. um, and that's and that's what happens. Yeah. Uh, so we open. This is the, this could easily have been also the final issue for the story arc. Let's be honest. Mm. I'm glad it's oh, not. Yeah. I'm glad we have the back half. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, but we go into this, um, Bruce's inner monologue, just him beating himself up inside, um, talking about all this he's failed in, in the Bat family, um, specifically uh, calling out Barbara, who's left the family recently, um, Stephanie, another dead soldier, another grave, and he calls out Jason in his mind for obvious reasons, and we, and not, it, you know, in-universe, obviously, it doesn't make much sense for him to linger on that thought, but, you know, it, f- from a storytelling perspective, we focus on that death more than others, and... Um, and I love the way that uh, uh, the Doug Mank draws that sort of death in the family recreation there. It's really nice. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so we go into the conclusion of family reunion face to face. And uh, and Jason just sort of uh, leaves Onyx there for the most part uh, after takes, taking the knife out of her. Takes the knife out. Um, he leaves her with this this important partially with this important thought. Hey, it's going to be hard to learn a great many things about me, but for but one one I'll give you for free. I am no one's son. Oh, 
god, so good. <clears throat> Which, but yeah, um, sorry, go ahead. It, it hurts, but it's you can just feel the anger and the pain of where Jason just is as a character. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And like you don't quite know exactly what he wants. And you won't until the and, very end. And you almost get the sense that he's not quite sure what he wants either, though. You know? Yeah. It's, um... I mean, there's, there's something obvious that you, that you want. You know, I mean, even just, you know, if you didn't have the added context of what this story is, um, even just, you know, a resurrected man who died at the hand of someone else, you know, the first thing Jason is going to want is, is probably something to do with the Joker, right? Um... But beyond that, you get the feeling that Jason doesn't have a plan after that. He doesn't know what he wants out of life beyond getting revenge for the man who murdered him, you know? Yes. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, so. he, you, you get the idea that, you know, he's, he, he still wants to clean up the streets and get rid of the most despicable. Because um, mm-hmm. it, it, is, it is very specifically the people he's killing are the ones who, especially the ones who fuck with kids. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that's great. But he turns to leave, and Batman shows up. And, and uh, this great fight breaks out between the two of them. Um, there's a lot of dialogue coming from Jason throughout this fight. Once again, pulling on that uh, that first thought bubble from Batman that we saw in the flash forward at the beginning of this story. Um, you know, where he says, like, he, he talks, not because he likes to. It, it, it's a distraction, you know, because Jason knows how Bruce fights. And this is the first time they've ever come face to face in this story. Yes. Um, and it's a you, 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 there's this real sense of climax throughout this. And, and once again, we're realistically only halfway through the story. <laughs> yes. Um, what's especially interesting is we then move out into the rain. Jason was going to try the rope trick again, but he gets tripped up. And he tries to, you know, use a taser to uh, electrify the rope for Bruce. Mm-hmm. Uh, we find out, okay, we, Bruce realizes, oh, he's stolen tech from Cord Industries. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, I, I need to figure out the truth. Um, they, they, they jump to a different rooftop. Um, there's this interesting thing where it's um like you know it's on on the rooftop like a proper battle but i want you to ask yourself what have i done tell me murder no i've killed not murdered fine no more blood and that's and we where get we the have... yeah we get the recreation of that first scene where he pulls off the mask and says you know we should keep it even and he takes off the hood and just this full page of bruce seeing jason as he is for the first time and I think that that's what's so striking about this full page. You know, like, like I feel like sometimes full page panels can be overutilized, you know, and, and not used for a specific purpose. But here you feel like there is a purpose to this shot. You see Jason as he is, as Bruce is afraid to see him, I think, you know, um, you see and, the and shock it, and disappointment of a genuinely loving father. Mm-hmm. And Jason just doesn't treat it like a big deal. You know, um, he he jokes. Bruce says, oh, God. And Jason goes, no, want to guess again? And right after that, Jason just sort of throws all, the, all this to the side. He's like, yeah, I know what you're going to do. You're going to check to see if it's even really me. So, like, there's this bit where he even takes a knife and, like, slices the back of his head, gives him some DNA samples. And, like, here, just test this. Go ahead. It's me, you know? <laughs> and um, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's we also wonderful. find out that you knew it when we fought in the graveyard. Come on. You felt it when, we sw- when I switched with Clayface, which... Which is certainly a take. It's a take. Like, when the fuck did they switch? I've looked over the hush panels while reading. I, this. I know you. You could see it in the hush panels. You can. I must can. have missed it. I, I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, clearly, I don't think it's obviously intended to be an actual swap, but you can find the spot that they're playing on when they show the hush panels. So okay, that's uh, that's a little silly, though. Like it is. It is very silly. <laughs> It is um, incredibly silly. I mean, it makes sense that Jason was actually involved because you know how else would Clayface know what Jason looked like? Looked like, um, but also but, just, just, just no. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so so Jason just he 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 leaves it at that. He doesn't actually want a fight here. You know, I mean, he he knows that he's gonna blow up his helmet. You know, and he does. He knows uh, that well, Bruce, he, he, he lays knows that Bruce is gonna make it out of it. He he lays it. He lays it out. That you know, you know, that you know, I'll be you. 
the you you're supposed to be. If you had killed Joker all those years ago, beyond what happened to me, you know what hell you would have saved this world? But no, his murder is a long list of sane acts you refuse to commit. You never cross that line, but I will. Death will come to those who deserve death, and death may come to those who stand in my way or doing what's right. All of your adult life, you fought to save Gotham, save her from herself, but you never, ever have understood her. She's evil, and you have to fight her where... Fight her where she lives. I live there. I'll be the one who finally brings peace. Oh God! Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And to to lay out Jason's way of thinking like that, so specifically and uh, and so effectively, I think, is is really the crux of this story, and really shows why bringing Jason back in this way not only works, but I would argue is necessary. I, I agree. Um, I oh, but I do think it's important that you know, with bringing him back, you need to do follow up. That sadly, and, and they you, do, you, and they do. That you sadly um, you don't necessarily get immediately, which is a shame. Um, but also, I would say, like you know, like keep in mind, we look at this as one story. It's fourteen issues, but it's really two halves. You know, there's yes. that three issue break between this issue and the next one. And it's because we're starting up a completely different side of the story next. Yes. And um, um, but yeah. and so really we do start to get our payoff there. You know, we, that's where we really lay out what Jason wants. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so he blows up his helmet, escapes, Bruce escapes as well, goes back to the Batcave and looks at uh, Jason's costume, which has been hanging up in a glass case um, ever since Frank Miller decided to throw that in The Dark Knight Returns. Yes, um, yes. thanks, Frank. <laughs> Thanks, sir. I mean, honestly, it, it's it's it will always be striking imagery, I think. Yes. Um, but Alfred asks, uh, would you like me to remove that from the cave? And to which Bruce replies, no, leave it. This doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything at all. And that's where we finish off the uh, family reunion. We go into the next story here, um, which is just a one part story called Show Me Yesterday for I Can't Find Today. Um, this, this is also where we begin the covers by Jock, um, where we see specifically just a recreation of a younger Bruce and a young Jason Todd as Batman and Robin. Um, which I, I love. Um, mm-hmm. And this is where we kind of shift a lot of the narration away from Bruce's narration onto Alfred. Which I think is also just a really good decision. Mm-hmm. Because... In addition to Bruce Wayne being the father of the Bat family, Alfred Pennyworth is the grandfather of the Bat family. Alfred Pennyworth is the mom. Um, <laughs> that too. <laughs> um. Um, but yeah, no, definitely. And uh, so, so from Alfred's perspective here, we, we go right in. We see that um, that he's keeping this patrol on Jason's grave, which is meant to meant to be a secret this whole time. Um, uh, also, this. Um, uh, this issue is once again drawn by Doug Mank and just again killing it as he always does. Um, but yeah, so he has has like these guards like watching the uh, watching outside of the grave. Bruce is watching the grave from a distance and he goes into it and and is just looking for signs of tampering. Is really just trying to make himself believe that there is more to this than what it is. And Alfred, and- you know, stoic, stiff British stiff upper lip. But you can see in his eyes just the pain that this has caused. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so it's consuming Bruce. He's been at this grave six times mm-hmm. trying to understand and, and just learn the truth. And he can't. Yeah. And we get the first of a couple of flashbacks. Yeah. To... Um, we, we see a, a flashback to second chances, first off. Um, we see uh, we see how Jason was first found by Batman, stealing the tires off the Batmobile. Um and he took Jason in, and became, uh, Jason became Robin, and it's just—it's really nice to see. We get these really nice scenes where, um, uh, where we see Jason just... is is an innocent, and is again. This is where we get Jason Todd doing nothing wrong. Cause... Yeah. See, there you go. Also, He's... interestingly, they do this. They do pretty much all these flashback scenes in the animated film, um, but because they wanted to keep it like strictly in a Batman universe, um, the Captain Boomerang role here is replaced with Riddler, and, and Riddler, Riddler in that voiced... film was played by Bruce Tim. <laughs> voiced by Bruce Tim, yeah, <laughs> which, um, which is just fun. Um, yeah, it's Captain Boomerang here, and that's just kind of fun. Um, um, 
You know Captain Boomerang, right? I don't think we've I, ever I talked about him on the podcast. I isn't he, he, he? Isn't he a Flash villain? He is a Flash villain. Yeah, and his deal, and, and, is... and also a, a big member of the the Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad. Uh, but yeah, like I know his deal is he has boomerangs, like Oliver Queen ha- Queen has arrows. Yes, <laughs> yes, and he's really good with them. Most of and that's all. You need and to also, know. he's a bastard. He's just an awful human being, and I love him. Um, I love some of Alpha's narration of the flashback. Uh, he never forgets the horrific act that gave birth to his cause, but I'd say the crippling grief retreats a bit, and he feels it just a little less. He said he brought Jason to the fold to keep the boy from winding up on the wrong path. That if he had not interceded, the boy would have become part of the part of the criminal element. But that's it's not entirely untrue. But the whole truth was obvious. He liked having him out there. So good. Which I, um, I it, it helps emphasize just that Jason is was an innocent in all of this, mm-hmm. and that you know his 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 death and death in the family was killing an innocent. And. That's an innocent, an innocent who, within that context, though it has been changed quite a bit in, that, in adapted material, um, an innocent who, in that context, just wanted to find his mom. And, and, and save his mom. And yeah. even in this context, because the next we get a flashback to death in the family later on, mm-hmm. and she's there. Like, it's it's following yeah. uh, the same way. Anyway. Uh, meanwhile, in the Batcave, Bruce is investigating the coffin. He, we learned that he had, like, these sensors uh, around it that, like, if anyone opened it, he would know. Um, nothing there has been tampered with. And... He's also been awake for 80 hours, so, like, he should be collapsing. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just... I think and, it's and, just and it's sheer... just Bruce's force of will that keeps him going. And, um, and how... And how... how you know, throughout this entire story, started off with the death of Stephanie, um, but continued by the resurrection of Jason Todd. Um, how Bruce has been very stoic and he's pushed these these feelings away from him for the most part. But here, you see how much it's really getting to him, not in an outward sense, but in the sheer fact that he has dedicated the last 80 hours of his life to Jason Todd, a kid who's been dead Todd. for years. Like, uh, I love that. I, 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 I genuinely love that. Yeah, but there's uh, there's also I think just the important the, the really important thing to note is that having the context of Stephanie Brown being dead helps build it mm-hmm. and helps make this reaction and this first half of the second like the, the second half work just as well as the first half because mm-hmm. a lot of this they cut from the movie. Yeah. Um, and you think you don't lose anything um but you you um like you just you get so much more in this version that like wouldn't work in a film and it's yeah it's perfect yeah. but we um, use that to a different flashback now now i want to know if you think this is in line with the jason the later jason todd that you saw in death in the family this scene where he um where he where he breaks a guy's uh or what is he he what shatters his collarbone yeah he shatters, shatters, shatters his the collarbone, collarbone of the guy here um because he's 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 a dealer, he, you know. He's 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 not giving them the information that they want. Um, and Bruce flips out on him, and we we see Jason refer Amanda for this, and Jason thinks in his mind that he did nothing wrong. And I'm I'm curious what your take on that is. I think, I think it's flashes. It, it it's meant to be flashes of that Jason perhaps had the potential to become Red Hood. But I think it's important to note that Winnick is using this flashback, one, from the point of view of a, a very tired and broken Bruce Wayne and Alfred Pennyworth. Like, mm-hmm. I think that's important. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I think we're actually being a little unreliable. Because I, 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 the whole idea being is, you know, the first flashback was just this perfect, happy, everything's happy, nothing's, t- nothing's, nothing's wrong, Jason mm-hmm. is, is perfect, whereas this is meant to be more Bruce reflecting on his fuck up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I and, think, and, and, and may, maybe looking at ways that he could have prevented this. Yes. And I yeah. think that's a mistake. Now I will say Jason does have the streak of when danger to other children is involved in death in the family, he gets angry, mm-hmm. but he's not permanently angry. And that's a mistake to portray Jason Todd Robin as just per- as the angry one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's not. 
he mm-hmm. should be a more fully fleshed out character. Yeah. Also, let Jason and Bruce as like father and son have a good dynamic in 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 like that time period because yeah yeah that's kind of the point. Like yeah, yeah the whole point of the death is that it's an it's an innocent lost and it fucks up everyone's like mindset. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but then we go into finish off the issue and Bruce's investigating leads him to one conclusion. There has never been a body in this coffin. And this is a point where I said, like, wait, what? Just because <laughs> now, like, now you knew that the resurrection was different from just Lazarus Pit, like yes. it was in the film, right? Yes. And we'll I, and I knew, knew a little bit about it going in, right? I think I, I, knew, I had mentioned a few. You things. mentioned the big conceit of how it happens. Yes. Uh, um, see Twitter question about one retcon punch, as it will be punch. known now. <laughs> yes. Um, um, and I... Even then, my question's like, wait. My, my, my brain's like, wait, this still doesn't make sense, because then it, it, it implies, oh, he's alive. Well, then where did he go? If there was never a body in the coffin... How? Yes. Like... Um, but more on that later. Meanwhile, we go into uh, Batman six, uh, 646. 646. Uh, and we start off this wonderfully fucking hilarious two-part story called Franchise. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, yeah. like, more about how funny it is specifically in part two. But my god, I know you weren't ready for what this one was about to throw at you. <laughs> this... This this might be where I think the story kind of drags a little bit. Like I I don't think it drags. I just think it tries to tell a normal Batman story in a very not normal setting. Also with like a there's just a ton of tonal whiplash. Um, oh, definitely. So, so we open in a meth stuff. lab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Walt and Jesse over here uh, get get fucked over by Batman. When he did comes Breaking in, Bad goes, start? <laughs> Uh, Breaking Bad started in 2008. So this is long before Breaking it's, Bad. Yes. <laughs> Who's to say that Vince Gilligan Vince is Gilligan. Not inspired by Batman 646? Hmm? I mean, who's to say? Who's to say? <laughs> uh, um, also, the story, at least part one, is part two also drawn by Shane Davis? No, is it part just... two is Mank. Like, okay, so just, so just I, this part is drawn, drawn by Shane Davis. I think Mank just, like, occasionally probably got busy with something else. Yeah, I mean, it is, like over a year of doing one story. Yes. You know? well, it's, it's, it's you're, really you're, you're, bas- you're basically asking someone who isn't used to doing the Jeff Loeb Tim Sale format to do the Jeff Loeb Tim Sale format. Yes. You know? Um, but anyway, so yeah, so Batman fucks with the meth lab. Um, and uh, uh, and that, that, that's all the scene is. Oh yeah, meanwhile he's being watched by Jason through a camera in that lab. He, he finds and, some explosives that Jason planted Bruce. And it's it's great to have some more casual interactions between an evil Jason Todd and Bruce now knowing yes. that it's Jason Todd. Um, yeah, it's it's just nice to have there. You know, like Jason Jason is sarcastic with Bruce and Bruce in the same way that he is to the rest of the drug dealers we've seen him interacting with throughout this story. Yeah, it's like I never get tired of watching you work. Um, uh, it's like you know Bruce shows over hardly get out Bruce I'm taking down the building. And um, he does. Uh, the building blows up. Bruce gets out of there. Um, he uh, he goes over to the building where he knows that Jason is watching from, and um, and chases Jason out of there. Jason drives Jason, away on a motorcycle. Well, well, well as he's explaining the building, Jason just looks like he looks. He looks so sad in just this one panel. I just yeah. love to watch you work. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. <sighs> There's this subtle internal conflict, like. He doesn't blow the building until he knows that Bruce has gotten everybody out safe. Like mm-hmm. it's he there, it's just it's this internal conflict that I that I that is a thread that I think is just very important to the character. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. But yeah, you know, Chase is on a motorcycle. <laughs> Some great uh great action for Jason. Yeah. Um, um and through all this, uh, well, afterwards, uh, Black Mask is freaking out that Jason is still at it. Um, like, you want to tell me why this guy ain't dead? <laughs> and, like, I just... 
I one can wonder where Wade Williams got the idea to to play the character as like Southern, but I think it's lines like that that make you just want to play Black Mask as Southern. <laughs> no. Um, also, um, and why in the hell hasn't Batman wiped this little smear off the face of the planet? Maybe he doesn't want to. And that's just another little thread that I think should be pulled on. Yeah, it's a very and good it's, question. It's, and not just specifically in the Black Mask versus Red Hood question, but in any Batman story where it's crime family facing crime family, you know, it's is Batman less willing to go further because he knows that these guys are taking each other out? Which is a very good question. He also, I, th- I, th- I think that's a bit different here because it's Jason and I think he does want to be more involved. But in other stories, I think that question is very applicable. Well, it's also clear that, you know, Bruce doesn't want to take down his son. Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, what it's, it's fascinating. Like, you have the first half ending with nothing has changed. That's just an outright lie. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's. it's Mainly there to. I mean, I mean, Bruce's most of the Batman stories we've read are just Bruce constantly lying to himself about things that he knows are true. Yes, (laughs) Um, Uh, that's when uh, Batman works at his best, honestly. Um, And then in this incredibly funny scene where where Black Mask is uh, is saying like, "Oh yeah, well he can't catch Red Hood either." He goes, "Can't you feel it? We're stuck in uh, stuck in the damn crossfire." And as he's stuck in the crossfire (laughs) of a rocket powered grenade, as as Jason just waves hi to him from across the building, (laughs) and he blows up Black Black Mask's building, and Black Mask gets out with Lee and a couple of his men. I was like, "Wow, he can move when he really wants to." (laughs) Right, (laughs) it's so good. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so, so he escapes, um, and then Black Mask is, uh, is, 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 uh, is contacted by none other than Slade fucking Wilson. Wilson. Deathstroke. <laughs> and, like, I remember you messaged me, you're like, oh shit, Deathstroke is here. <laughs> it was meant to be like, oh shit, Deathstroke's here, because my brain's like, where the fuck are we going with this? <laughs> Because it feels a bit random. And let's be real, it's very random. <laughs> it's very it's random. Um, yeah. Deathstroke is like, yes, you know, you got something to say? Yes, there's a collective called The Society. The Society? Yes, and I was wondering if you'd like to join. And we see six-panel grid paralleling what Jason sees and Bruce sees. And both of them just come to the conclusion of, damn it. And then we go into Batman 647, the second half of franchise, and my god. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, this one is just off <laughs> the rails? It's... And, like, I just... <laughs> I think I enjoyed this one, but I think it was it... off also the rails. Th- this, also, this, um... Uh... The, the the this the the opening scene here with uh with Deathstroke and Black Mask um sort of is spawns it, in in my opinion uh, uh, what 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 adap- what is adapted into like my favorite line in the animated film um in the comic here it's the I want him dead I mean the big kind of dead serious Jeez. dead head on a pike guts on the pavement me wearing a sweater vest made of his skin kind of dead <laughs> like it's so good um. Yeah, just it, it's great, and it, it once again, Black Mask is just such a funny character in this. Um, then you have fucking Slade Wilson working out him. He's like, "Oh, don't worry, I got some people from the, from the society to help us out." And Black Mask goes, "Are you fucking kidding me, <laughs> Captain Nazi and the hyena?" <laughs> Which just like okay, <laughs> the rails have gone off. Now we actually open this with a prologue with Alfred establishing that Bruce is unsure. That is an amazing scene. It's perfect, but like that quickly then just. That is then this happy undercut by all this shit. <laughs> At this point, my notes is like, well, this is a weird level of camp. Yeah, that just sort of came out of nowhere from this really heavy story. <laughs> <laughs> I am very glad these issues were basically cut from the film. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you imagine? Well, no, they aren't because they spawn one of the most interesting scenes in the film where they get these other like assassin characters to replace the society members here. Yeah, and still like, get seen at the end. Doesn't here. do it nearly as intensely, right? That's, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, they, they, also, Black Mask and Deathstroke like muse over the gender of the hyena. I think I don't know. I think it's kind of a funny scene. <laughs> it's funny. 
My note is the camp intensifies. Yes, and that's all just... it does for the rest of the issue until once again we get a surprisingly heavy moment at the end of the issue. <laughs> but um, yeah, we we get them questions like you know the Red Hood, uh, you know there's a third member on the way who will make all the, this all a perfect combo. I promise. If you have positioned all the proper players, the Red Hood will be dead. Fine. Panel of them looking. Black mask. Hyena kind of looks like a girl from the back. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> And at that point, I just start laughing and giving into the absurdity of the camp because... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just go along with it. And then Red Hood is attacked by Captain Nazi and the Hyena. And I just love saying that out loud. <laughs> it's, like, it's just really funny. Um, so this fight begins. Uh, we learn that Captain Nazi is immune to bullets. And I just, I love that. <laughs> Mind you, Al- while this fight is happening, Alfred is narrating... <laughs> Which is, it's, it's such a juxtaposition, you know, um, uh, which it's interesting because, you know, it's, it's Master Jason's had a condescending practice of referring to the costume criminal elements as dress ups. He also noted that such individuals did not fear the Batman the same way the street toughs and mafioso did. The dress ups did not believe that he was a monster. I explained to Jason that he was correct, but only to a certain degree. These individuals with their special abilities, these men who could do the unimaginable, these madmen, they have their own myths. Some believe he's just a man. Others believe he's an army. Some think he can't be injured. Others believe he can't die. But the boy did say something to me that chilled me to the bone even then. They all know he won't kill them. I'm not sure what frightened me more. Oh, it's so good. I think that's it's only frightening with the retrospect also just yeah like this happens and then um batman shows up Mm -hmm. and at that moment you know that that alfred monologue is is perfectly juxtaposed with batman arriving and and saying like oh well we're not going to kill these guys here you know um you know and and he refuses to kill either captain nazi or the hyena and then also uh that our third member arrives and our third member is count vertigo are you familiar with this character at all Uh, yes, because... I think he was on Arrow, right? He was on Arrow. Yeah, uh, yeah there were two versions on Arrow, right? I don't, I don't think I got that far. There was at least the second, one. The second one was played by Peter Stormare, and he's amazing. Um, but yeah, so, okay, so yeah, so he's typically a Green Arrow villain. Um, but he's here, and uh, we, get, we get this great little moment where he's like, um, he's like, he's like messing with Batman's mind. Um, and, Batman uh, goes blind, and... <laughs> This is where you get to see some very sweet father-son Bruce Jason moments. Mm-hmm. Just because it's, you know, it's like, Hood, do you have any inje- injectable adrenaline? Adrenaline or any other hard sim- stimulants. Crawl towards the hyena, t- 3 o'clock, 12 feet, dose him. Unreal, never down, never out. It's an admirable attempt, Batman. But And Jason's like, Jason's resisting fatherly love, but mm-hmm. like... Bruce is but still, still reaching there. out. Like, Bruce still cares about Jason. Um, uh, though, just a reminder, this is among the camp of fighting a, a, a Nazi, a hyena, and a man who uses sound to fuck up people's hearing and give them vertigo. Just, yes. Just, just, this is what happens in this story that we are covering. So we, um... Uh, yeah, so, um, so the adrenaline gets to Hyena, Hyena goes to attack Vertigo, so that's that dealt with, and, uh, and rather brilliantly, the only character we murder here is the Nazi. Um, the Nazi. At that point, (laughs) in my notes, I was like, you know, Bruce, don't be angry, Jason killed a Nazi, fuck Nazis. I mean, they at least acknowledge that, like, Batman's like, no, and and Red Hood goes, yes, did you actually think this would go any other way? I just, uh, just be happy, I only killed the Nazi. (laughs) Now, I think that's, again, I'm... I think, again, this is Jason putting on a mask a little bit at this moment. How so? I think he's moving on. It's like, oh, I only killed the Nazi. Or it's like, mm, I think you only... Int- I don't think your co- your code that you've set up would let you kill Vertigo and the Hyena. Mm, I disagree. I think Jason would happily kill Vertigo and the Hyena. I don't know. I, I I I disagree. I think I think Jason has been very specifically. I, just, I, I would say just like think about how many other people Jason's been totally okay with killing. You know, yeah, but he, all of he's them... he's killed far less offensive people than the literal Nazi. Yeah, but all of them have had specific connections 
to the worst of the worst. Okay. It's, it's I mean, all specifically been rings of people who, you know, dealt to children. I think we'll have to agree to disagree on this one. But, okay. um, um, yeah, so yeah. Jason, Jason escapes, and we go into the final actual arc of this uh, this uh, story. Oh, yeah. Are we, all they yeah. do is watch us kill. And I think that's a brilliant name for this last three-part. Uh, yes. Um, just, ah, oh, it's beautiful. And also, it opens on, like, another one of my absolute favorite scenes. Favorite scenes. This um, might be the best scene in the story arc. So, like, Alfred, um, you know what? I think I'm just going to read this straight, if you wouldn't mind. Go um, right ahead. So, um, when I see the mail carrier, which is not often, he always makes the same joke. It'd be faster if you drove. He is correct. It would be. The mail drop uh, uh, is, is in a pillar on the main gate, a good quarter mile from the house. But I am not so, uh, not so decrepit that, that the walk pains me, and frankly, I like the walk. I am reminded of, as the saying goes, simpler times. At a time when I was still co- when I still called him Master Bruce, he and I would take this walk. It was after his parents' death, and it, uh, and it was one of the few activities that seemed to lift the spirits of this troubled boy. We, meaning he and I, had stumbled, uh, stumbled upon the hobby of collecting first edition books. Admittedly, not a common pastime for, for a young lad, but Bruce was anything but common. He seemed less attracted to the actual acquisition of something original than he was of the act of searching for it. Nonetheless, it seemed to stir up some, some of the excitement he used to exude before the tragedy. A bookstore in, uh, in Kensington w- would authenticate our finds. We waited for, with great anticipation for the book's arrival in the store's small, small blue shipping boxes. Even today, despite the vast change in direction our lives have taken, we still collect first editions, he and I. Only two other pe- person, uh, persons knew of this tradition. One wears a mask, lives a double life, and, flashes, uh, and fights like, a man who ra- like the man who raised him. The other is dead. At least I believe that until uh, believe that until today. And uh, Alfred opens a box with two first editions in it, say, uh, with a note that says B and A, just two to add to the pile. Cheers, Jason. All they do is watch us kill. Part one. Writer Judd Winnick, penciler Doug Mank, and oh my God, you know you're in for a ride with that one. Um, oh my God, that hits so hard. I love and that. Again, it's and also I like the idea. That Alfred still, through all this, did not believe that Jason was back until that. It, it flips a switch. Also, just this idea of Jason essentially doing a nice act just to fuck their heads. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's also really something nice. that we co- something that you commented on last issue that there is still that familial bond there, um, and that Jason is using that familial bond to get to them. I'd argue he's he is some of it's secretly just somewhere deep down almost crying out for help. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean that that's that's it. I mean it, that's what making Jason the Red Hood does to his character. And it, it you know because there was always that connection between Dick and Bruce that Dick had lost his parents at a young age around the same age that Bruce lost his. But when Jason became Robin, there was not that same connection between those characters. But when making him Red Hood, you turn Jason as Red Hood into what Bruce is as Batman. And that is just a scared little boy crying out for help. Yes. And that and it, it, I think is why it is so important that Jason Todd is the Red Hood, and uh, and why I would not change that for the world. I I also think in the context of this story, it's I think it's because Jason has a master plan, and this is where we're going to see it. But this feels like he's he's just crying out to be stopped for at least one part of the plan. Hmm. Like that well, I think part. no matter what, because of the main event that this three-parter focuses on, um, I think no matter what, like Jason wants to enact that one part of his plan. You know, but there's, a, I don't think we're, ta- we may not be talking about the same part. I'm talking about the Joker thing. I'm not. You're talking about the Black Mask thing. That makes sense. I think he I'm talking about the Bloodhaven thing. Oh, that thing. Okay, hmm. that's the thing where it just feels. And and we'll talk about it when we get to it, because just the way Jason looks through, like, when Bruce isn't watching when it happens. Yeah. It's it's this resistance of, oh, God, what have I done? Mm-hmm. Which I... But anyway, um, so we open up. 
Alfred informs Bruce, of course, of the first editions. He's authenticating it. Um, he's, meanwhile, he's Black... checking the also the other package that was in with the first editions. And Black Mask is pissed. I'm not happy, you know, you all know. I'm not happy, and despite appearances, this ain't a damn smile on my face. <laughs> it's so good. Like, I know I've said it a million times in this podcast. He's such a funny fucking character. Like, he's so great. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, he's talking to, like, his, uh, his fellow, fellow dealers and, 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 and crime lords, whatever. Um, and, uh, and through all this, there's this nice little conversation here, which beautifully ends in Black Mass just pulling out a machine gun and killing all of them. And um, shooting all of them. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Black Mass throws down the gun and says, happy, and Red Hood arrives and says, getting there. Getting there. Um, so yeah, so uh, Bruce and Alfred continue to talk about the package that arrived. As Alfred's um, opening it. Mm-hmm. Um, he pulls Alfred. out this little paper from the package uh, that that, uh, that has an address um, and confirms that Jason has the Joker. Um, yeah, there's a lock of green hair. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so, uh, so there's an address in the card and... Um, and Bruce says, give it to me now. Meanwhile, Red Hood is talking to Black Mask. Um, there's some great just arguing about what they're doing. And then a fight breaks out. And it's just a really fun little scene. Yeah, it's 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 a great scene where Jason kind of has the upper hand through the entire thing. Mm-hmm. Um, which which makes it even better when you consider the twist that the scene is going towards. Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this fight breaks out between the two of them. Um, Black Mask is, I mean, I don't know if you were surprised by this at all, but Black Mask is very, very physically capable. Um, that, that doesn't surprise me. He he had to get somewhere in Gotham City to, to become the crime lord, the, the crime True. lord that he is. Like, Mm-mm. you have, if, if you're working in a post-Batman world, you kind of have to be physically impressive somehow. Yeah. Like when and you if got... you're not, and if you're not, at least be intellectually impressive. And I don't think Roman Sionis is especially, not that he's not smart, but but certainly he's doesn't not, come across that way in this story. He's not. He's not the Riddler orchestrating hush levels of smart. Yeah, he yeah, is. Exactly. He is competent. Normally competent. Mm-hmm. But anyway, this fight goes on for a while. Uh, I also, also, I love, I love, I love the sign, you know, um, I love, like, where where Mask is getting the upper hand. Look at you, tarted up like some gladiator biker, covered in body armor. See what I'm wearing, boy? Do you feel what you're hitting when you nail me? Skin. And Daddy's not afraid of losing some. (laughs) So funny. Um, uh, Also, we haven't really commented on, on it all story, but what do you think of the squiggly knife? I like the squiggly knife. I think... I think that it's a deliberate choice. It kind of evokes Middle Eastern knives, or like the Western image of Middle Eastern knives. Okay. Which I think is I think one. also there there is meant to be a logistic reason behind it too, like something about it, about the shape is meant to be able to cut through Batman's armor or whatever. That too. Um, also it would do more damage in the skin because it's, you know, squiggly. That's going to widen the hole and yeah. make it even harder. Um but anyway, so yeah, so um, through this fight, uh, Black Mask eventually wins. He um, he 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 takes the knife and stabs it back through uh, Red Hood's chest, and that's where we end the issue. As Batman arrives there and sees his son die again, um, or at least what he believes is his son. As we go into Batman six forty nine, great cover here. This is the best Jock cover. I love this one. It is. Um, but yeah, so we open up that uh, this second issue here of the of the final story. And uh, and Jason is apparently dead, or I mean, not really. We, we uh, Black Mask pulls off the the red hood from him, and uh, and we see that it's just some other guy. Uh, do we? We don't know who this guy is, do we? Uh, no, we don't. No. Mm. Oh, I, I don't know if it was just like something I missed earlier. That, I think uh, it's someone who works for for who worked what? for Black Mask. Mm. Is... Well, well, no, I, no, I guess he can't really work for Black Ma- Black Mask because the idea is that. Black Mask doesn't really recognize that it's recognize the person at first. Like he thinks that oh, he right. that, that that's actually who the Red Hood is underneath. Right, and then and then Jason because he, he says uh, he says I understand why you wear the helmet. Yeah, you were one ugly son of a, and then he gets cut off. Yeah, um, 
and, you see, and Black Mask sees that Batman's there, and the the hood as Black Mask is holding it continues to talk. Um, and it's Jason talking through through a microphone. There we see a full page that Jason has the Joker, and um, and, and Joker goes, "Didn't I kill you? Kill you? <laughs> We've been over this. I know, but I like talking about it." <laughs> also, the Joker in these last two issues, Chef's Kiss, brilliant. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, not not. I mean, yeah, but both both drawing. Actually, this issue is drawn by Eric Battle. Um, yes, but uh, but writing wise, I mean, like Winnick perfectly nails the kind of Joker I love to see. Um, but yeah, uh, so moving on. Uh, fight breaks out, um, and uh, or not even really now. Um, uh, we see that uh, the, uh, the this this Red Hood mask is is rigged again to to explode. So Batman kicks out of Black Mask's hand, throws it out there, and uh, uh, Black Mask escapes. Right? Yeah, Black Mask Black Mask escapes. Um, and uh, and Batman goes after Jason as uh, as Jason has Joker held up here, and we get this brilliant scene where Jason is talking to Joker, and Joker is doing his Joker thing. He's trying to taunt Jason, and uh, and Jason like throws a knife into Joker's shoulder, and um, and Joker's like, dude, it doesn't phase him because he's the Joker. Um, um, I, but- I love I love I love how the Joker's trying to work out like how are you still alive? So yeah, mm-hmm. it's like like Batman and Robin and me. Yes, we're one big happy family. I like to think so. And speaking of relations, it leads us to the $24,000 question. Which, believe it or not, Lazarus is not why you're not still worm food. But why am I still among the sweaty grass, uh, sweaty masses? I should be pillow fights, I should be having pillow fights with St. Peter by now. Which, one, just the idea that the Joker thinks he's going to heaven. <laughs> like, <laughs> which, which is great. Like, it, it's, it's so Joker. I love it. Um... But this all this all leads up to this great moment where Joker, like you know, really getting under Jason's skin. Jason goes, um, "But I know a secret, a good one." Um, and Joker goes, "Ooh, loves me a secret, a do tell." And Jason goes, "You're not nearly as crazy you'd like you'd like us all to believe, or even as crazy as you'd like to believe. It just makes it easier to justify every sick, monstrous thing you've ever done when you play the part of the mad clown. You're you're crazy, Bubba, but you uh, but you ain't that crazy. Look at that. I like to smile off the Joker's face. I have been waiting for that a long time." <laughs> And um, it's just, it's a great little moment where Jason actually gets to the Joker, and that's that's kind of all he needs. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so um, so yeah, so Batman goes after, or uh, Batman gets the um, uh, finds this little like card that um that says uh, the East End, you know where. Um, so Batman takes the Batmobile over to um to crime over to where over to Crime Alley, where where it but all began. That, the Black Mask is swiftly written out by Bruce. Interestingly, throwing explosives at his feet, making him stand in place, stand in place, basically for the police to come, mm-hmm. which is such a clever way of getting him out of the rest of the story, as well as understanding, continuing the parallel of Bruce and Jason aren't all that different. Mm. And also, way. I mean, also, I think it's fair to assume that Bruce didn't actually throw explosives down there. Oh, yeah, they're probably just like like little bits of plastic or something. Yeah. You know? Um, but anyway, so, uh, and also just writing out black mask and, and about as a comedic way as he's been throughout the story. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, uh, uh, Bruce and Jason meet up. Um, it's, it's, it's where it all began. It's, it's in crime alley. And, um, and as they're about to fight, we see, uh, what Jason's plan in the end is. And it's it's so interesting because it's not really touched upon much in, in the rest of this story, which kind of No, hurts. it isn't. Um, not that anyone believes it for a second, but Jason blows up Bloodhaven, um, supposedly killing Dick Grayson. And, yeah, uh, um, well, and what's interesting is... <sighs> Is well, that you talked about this moment? Here yeah, earlier, it's just this moment where, here. He's like, that's Bloodhaven. The way Jason is drawn there, mm-hmm. he just he looks so solemn, like he almost just didn't think it would actually happen or it wouldn't go through with it. Mm-hmm. He sees, but he, he did, Bruce, and, and he's truly done something awful, you know. And I'm I, not that I, he hasn't I, done awful things before, but this, like, this is something this that is goes awful against every. Him every awful thing he's done in a different Cause, way. Because he's targeting Dick Grayson, and Jason has no reason to hate Dick Grayson. And, 
you can then see he, he he tries to get a quip in, but something about the quip just feels hollow. Now again, I think it's the way that Jason's drawn. Like, yeah, he he isn't... says um he says is Nightwing there? Imagine that one son returns from the grave as another enters it. What a fitting ending this has become. But and and he's smiling, but it's not that shitting grin that he's had for a lot of this story, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's this subdued like, ooh, I didn't think this would happen. Yeah. And uh, uh, and it and it suddenly becomes so much more interesting uh, as we go into the final issue of all they do is watch us kill, which is Batman six fifty, uh, another great jock cover, but I don't think it's as good as that last one. No. Yeah. Um, um, but it's fitting for the end. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so we pick up exactly where we left off. Um, uh, there's an explosive that goes out beneath Bruce as um, as he as he tries to uh, to run away, but Jason like keeps him there and says like you know like like we're ending this here and now. Um, uh, meanwhile, uh, Joker is below listening to what's happening above. He has all these explosives around him, ready to go off at any second, I imagine. Um, and uh, and uh, and the fight begins. We get another great fight between Bruce and Jason. Um, really, just nailing in the art here. Um, once again, uh, Doug Mank is back on it, right? Uh, right. Oh, no, 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 no. It's Eric Battle, actually. Oh, so, yeah. So Eric Battle finishes this. Eric Battle finishes it off, yeah. Doug Mank does the annual, though. Um, yeah. Wow. But yeah. Anyway, but yeah. So Eric Battle finishes it off here, but really does nail, like, the expressions here and what makes this fight so difficult for both of them. Because they're, they're, at this point, they're just animals going at it, essentially. Mm-hmm. And um, because in Bruce's mind, Jason has, I think, now done something unforgivable. Yes. And uh, and Jason has always just hated Bruce through all this. Yes. And they're both ready for this to be over, essentially. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so sad. So, and meanwhile, the Joker, just hearing it, is just laughing like a maniac. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jason is trying to keep up the snarky commentary. He throws off his jacket at one point when Bruce catches it on fire mm-hmm. uh, and Bruce eventually just punches him in the face and Bruce, you know enough all of it ends tonight you say you want to save Gotham to kill a part of it so it can survive you say you mm-hmm. want to be better than me but it won't happen I know I failed you but I tried to save Jason now some people misinterpret him fa- I know I failed you as to imply as Robin the failure is Letting him die and not mm-hmm. being there for when he was resurrected. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and 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 we we go into this this great moment as as to why Jason hates Bruce here, and uh, it's it's a great line that's and this whole last scene here is pretty much adapted straight into the film um, because yes. it's it's perfect. Like all the dialogue is almost beat for beat the film. Um, Jason says, uh, "Is that what you think this is about? You are letting me die. I don't know what class your judgment judgment worse. Your guilt or your antiquated sense of morality." Bruce, I forgive you for not saving me, but why, why on God's earth is he still alive? So he doesn't hate Bruce for not saving him. That, that, that's that's the really important thing here. And that's what Bruce wants to think it's about. He wants to, like, for Bruce, his failure is not saving Jason. But for Jason, the real failure is Joker still being alive and, and that not being the final straw for Bruce. Yes, and there's some things in the annual that I think muddle this a little bit oh definitely uh, like <laughs> like we're gonna get into that annual after this that annual it's fucking is ass. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, like it's it's a mess really bad. like um, i i thought I, I, don't, I, I don't think it takes away enough that this scene is cheapened because this scene is so perfect it's a perfect scene but it just strike the annual out and you would have had a perfect story like yeah yeah. Like reflecting on the, the court of, of the owls, end of the day. which is a story that has an annual that screws things up, that doesn't screw mm-hmm. that story up. That that just screws up the new Fifty Two version of Mister Freeze. The story itself is fine. Mm-hmm. The annual has some big structural story problems. Yeah, and however, you bring up the court of owls comparison, and that was basically fixed by them just never bringing up that version of Mister Freeze again. Exactly. M- much like that with the annual. They never bring up how Jason came back ever again. 
Yes. Well, I mean, don't they like, like, change like, it? No, I, like, I'll tell you that now. Like, 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 they don't change it, but every time they mention, like, oh, Jason, how'd you come back? He's like, oh, that doesn't matter. I just did, you know? Like, they'll never, well. they'll never talk about how it happened again because they know it's terrible. <laughs> Um, but anyway, great last scene here. I'm not going to go through a beat for beat because I would probably just end up reading the whole thing out loud. There are there are things I love. I love all the Joker's dialogue. Uh, oh, Joker jo- jo- interjecting it as like as like Bruce and Jason are just laying out their morality and and, and philosophy well, on life. <laughs> yeah. No matter what happens, the Joker wins. Oh yeah, yeah. And I mean, this is even, even like, says it at the end, like, like you know, everybody loses. I'm, I'm getting what I want. You know. <laughs> um, and, and what's funny, this hasn't been like a secret Joker scheme. Mm-hmm. But like, he no, just no, gets... he's he's just taking advantage of the situation. And it's it's delightful. Now, um, I also uh, oh leads up to this wonderful moment, of course, where um where Jason kicks a gun Bruce's way, Bruce picks it up. And um, and Jason says like if you want this to end, you have to kill me. Otherwise, I'm killing Joker. Um, and wow. as Jason is saying this, um, Jason says, um, "All you've got, uh, all you've got is a headshot. I'm going to blow up. Um, I'm going to blow his, blow his adult deranged brains out. And if you want to stop it, you're going to have to shoot me right in my face." And as he says that, a single tear falls from his eye, and he is just broken. Like, oh my god. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Because um, because what this is this is a cry for, this is a cry for help. That that's mm-hmm. what this is. Yeah. Um, the, the, too, I think too many times people have a tendency to read comics and not be able to read between the lines of what's actually happening in a scene. Because mm-hmm. this lays the art is what lays it. The words are saying one thing. The art is telling you what you actually need to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, of course, before Jason shoots Joker, uh, Bruce throws a batarang into Jason, um, absolutely uh, incapacitating him. And Joker takes the gun. And well, one, shoots... I love how Joker's just like, you got him, you expert rootin' tootin' eagle-eyed goth marksman son of a bitch. You bank that batter thing off the pipe. <laughs> um just oh it's so good um and I, I, again just the film just the way john dimaggio plays that scene is so perfect <laughs> um um but as um okay so he says um uh oh god i love it you managed to find a way to win and everybody still loses except me my uh, my dark little pumpkin pies i'm the one who's gonna get what he wants tonight bada bing bada boom yeah yes don't you just love how it's ending toodles and then he shoots the the, the c4, c4 there and blows up the building and that is where the story ends there is no there's no resolution you're just like oh fuck yeah um, which is interesting because I, I do like the little epilogue that the film gives it, but I think that is still very effective as an end. Yes. Well, it's a very effective end because you're just like, because very much you could have had this thing. This could also be Jason Todd dying a second time and him not continuing on. Mm-hmm. I'm glad they don't. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, I think there are more stories to tell. And I, again, give him an ongoing and, and, and actually care of, Actually, you know, give all the Robins their own ongoings and keep, give them to writers who care about these. I characters. mean, I mean, hell, that's what they did with the new Fifty Two. There was yeah. a Nightwing title. There was Red Hood and the Outlaws. Tim was head of the Teen Titans, and there was Batman and Robin. I really liked that era of of Bat Family books, even though not all of them were great. Like, I just liked that approach. Yeah, I mean, right now we technically have a Nightwing and Tim book. Yeah, publishing. Um, yeah, uh, the Damien, the solo Damien title did just end though recently. Yes, which kind of, which is kind of sad. But yeah. Anyway, um, let's get into the final I'm, issue I'm here. Let's, let, 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 oh, Jacob, we got to rip the bandaid off. Um, let's talk about the cover though. The cover is drawn by Jock after Jim Aparo. It says, um, because it's it's Batman holding Red Hood in the in the Death in the Family position, and um, and it's it's, it's great. It's great. Um, I do. I actually, you know, I do actually prefer the second printing variant. Is the, let me flip to that. It's one. it's the, the one with Robin's skull. Oh right, yeah, that's actually a really cool one. Yeah, yeah, I love that one. Um, um yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, so, turn okay. of Jason Todd. <laughs> so we open with some monologue. Basically, it's like, okay, it is Jason Todd. Mm-hmm. You know, it is, and it's like it's a mystery until now. Now, <laughs> Dead Dedalus and Nick first the return of Jason Todd. So then. Yeah, so yeah. so um so Shane Davis is actually on pencils here. I don't know 
<laughs> we keep assuming it's Doug Mank when it's not. It's Shane Davis here. Um, but uh, but interestingly, so Shane Davis redraws Death in the Family. Um, we have yes. Joker beating Jason with a crowbar, his mom tied to the pole, Jason the saving his mom, the bomb, everything goes off, Batman looking through the rubble, Jason's dead body, whatever, you get the idea. But then, However... Then, but we have learned that time is more fluid than believed. Yes. And that the anger and frustration of a powerful boy trapped between his existence and nothingness could change the world that we know. With each fit of rage, his fist colliding with the wall of his proverbial cell, he sent a ripple across time that would alter events. Um, the strange truth of this anomaly is uh, th- this wave that set so many bits of time on a different path did not change history, but set it right. And oh my god, right away, I just hate that approach so much to resurrecting Jason Todd. Well, you also see, like, in the glasses, you see, like, a lot of different DC characters... Like, this entire sequence is like, oh, pay attention, because there's a lot of characters changing things. Like, you see the Doom Patrol. Yeah. Uh, um, you see Donna Troy in, like, four different guises. Yeah. You and see then, uh, Kid Flash up there. Um, or no, sorry. Uh, yeah, Kid Flash up there. You see Hawkman. Or, 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 oh, no, sorry. No, it's not. Wait. I saw the yellow mask. Sorry. It's different versions of Hawkman. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into the actual best thing about this issue. Um, that is that they use the Jim Aparo uh, alternate ending page next. Yes. Um, and I really do like that. Just if nothing else, an excuse to actually print that thing in an issue. It's pretty cool. Um, it's pretty cool. So they, they, also, they print... like, and it does lead to some good-ish things. However. Now... Okay, so, so, so <laughs> to answer the question that Mason posed on Twitter... The in in short, a version of Superman, just to make it as simple as possible, a version of Superman punched a hole in the universe, sending ripples out through the DC universe or multiple DC universes, universes. displacing time, specifically taking the alternate universe where Jason Todd lived and didn't die and placing that version of Jason, not that event, but just the Jason from that version of history that in lived the coffin. Into the coffin of dead Jason Todd. And uh, so I, I love the premise of him waking up in the coffin. I, it's you know, it's it's fucking horrifying. Like it's it's like, hor- it's, it's, it's a horror film. It's terrible. Like you see the the first you see his like his decomposing corpse come back to to life. Him screaming and crying and clawing his becoming calm and clawing his way out. So, but this is where this, I have an issue. Our, our well, first... yeah, because it's not the same Jason. Well, yeah, it's not the same Jason. He wasn't actually dead. And even, and furthermore, it contradicts the story itself. Yeah. Like, you're telling me Bruce Wayne did not have eyes on that grave in every possible way. So yeah. that if someone like the busted story straight out. Up says, the story straight up says that the coffin was never opened. And, the, and that no, nobody had ever been in the coffin. Yeah. Like, so. Uh, so how... Jason here, we see him taking his belt, using the metal from it to cut open the top of the coffin. He literally scratches his way through the coffin, breaking off his fingernails. His bloody hands reach through the top of the grave. He climbs out. It's horrifying. It's beautifully drawn. But my God, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. <laughs> and it only goes downhill from here. Yeah, like, yeah, somehow next next Jason like loses his memories or whatever, yeah, and he, he gets comes... hit by a car, and he loses his memories. One with the we get this established idea that somehow Dick Grayson, okay, so he's he's labeled a John Doe. They hear him asking for Bruce, and it was his like. Describing that as his father, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, they they had the police run prints, but Bruce Wayne, Alfred Pennyworth, Dick Grayson, and Jason Todd have no fingerprints on record anywhere on Earth, which, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Like, what? Like, I know, <clears throat> like, okay, it's like, ooh, Batman's prepared for everything to compromise his identity, but one, it's easier for, like, 
Bruce as Batman and Dick as Nightwing, they both wear gloves as part of their costume generally. Mm-hmm. And yet like, their fingerprints are there. They, like, like <laughs> that's... And then we get this scene where these guys, I'm assuming they, they're the, they're two of the ones that work for... Um, uh, I suppose for Alfred maybe. and Bruce, like the ones that guard the grave. Like, but like, like, and just, they just don't tell their bo- like, like they, they don't they don't follow up on that at all. And like, how do we cover up the whole grave thing? Are we to assume also, that they put a whole new coffin in there? I guess. Also, the text, the gravestone still says, here lies Jason Todd. Like, Yeah. So, no, well, I guess the way is, if the, if they're the ones working for Bruce, assuming that's the case, that they dug up that grave to cover it up and to put a new coffin in there. So that's how we get around Bruce saying that there was no body in the coffin. However, Bruce has sensors on the coffin. So he should have been alerted. He should, but they all, apparently they only work one way, which like, what, what? So, what? yeah, so the idea is that like, so I guess they never opened it when they took the coffin out of there. And so Jason climbing out of the grave didn't set off the sensors. Which is just like. But also when he gets the duplicate gr- uh, coffin, then how, yeah. Do how, they have would he, the how would he still have access to the sensors there? Like, assuming the sensors are in there, like, he doesn't have access to those same sensors, right? Right. Like, so anyway, Jason wakes up, climbs out of his little place where he's being held, becomes a bum on the streets. For some? Again. <laughs> it's it's for... bad. Like, like I don't even think the way we're describing it quite, quite gives off, like, how bad it is. Um, he steals and... bread from a bakery, is sleeping in an alley, gets accosted by some other homeless person... Mm-hmm. That jogs his memory of being Robin. This fight, and he becomes a fucking acrobat out of nowhere. And yeah. some guy. Oh, 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 the best part about this, he becomes an acrobat, fights off this guy. This guy on the side of the street recognizes this kid. He's like, "Oh, I saw a kid move exactly like that many years ago." <laughs> and then fucking informs the League of Assassins about this. Yeah, like, 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 <laughs> like what? What is this? <laughs> yeah, so okay, so then now okay, I just want to I just want to remind everybody. They did everything in their power to say that it wasn't a Lazarus pit. Even though that is an inbuilt way in the Batman universe to bring a character back to life. And that's yes. how they do it in the film and it works perfectly. It works perfectly. Here, they go out of their way. Hang on. They go out of their way to say that it was not a Lazarus pit multiple times. Yet here, not only do we involve the Lazarus Pit, but also just Talia and Raish as characters, even? Yeah. Like, Talia, okay, so Talia, for another year, keeps Jason as her, like, amnesiac pet. Mm-hmm. Like, I, okay, I... I don't blame them for not knowing Morrison's plans to introduce Damian Wayne in like a couple of months. Yeah, like like I, you can forgive that, and also this is meant to take place sometime well before this story. Talia. However, however, it still doesn't. One, it's like what Talia? What the fuck is your plan? What? What are you trying to accomplish? Like get to Bruce. So- yeah. Somehow, so she so she takes Jason, forces him into the Lazarus Pit at gunpoint. So okay, now hang on. It says many things can jog a memory, but few things uh, can give those memories life. Now, what memories is this version of Jason Todd getting back? Is he getting this universe's Jason Todd's memories That's of the being dead? It's- How does that happen? How does that happen? Now, let's keep in mind that Talia says before this, to enter the Lazarus Pit, however, will surely mean your death, perhaps death, perhaps more. Okay, look, as far as we understand it, the Lazarus Pit can resurrect people from the dead, or at the very least rejuvenate very old people, can heal you, make you strong, whatever. I don't think it can cross the dimensional boundaries (laughs) 
of and, the multiple universes that exist within DC's continuity and give a different version of a character the memories of their parallel universe counterpart. Yes. Who... Especially when this parallel universe counterpart was brought over here by an interdimensional crossing event. Like, it's... Uh, well, also, <laughs> here's the thing. Here's the, here, here's the even, like... Well, like, again, the weirder thing is just... This is also happening in the past. Like, this is still years ago. Because, remember, Jason still has to age to be an adult? Yes. Like, I I don't know. I don't, I don't know either. I don't know either. Um, so, so, also, so, race is just pissed. Yeah. At, like, but also, like, just I, we can assume just lets it go eventually. Because Talia yeah. and Jason run away. She kisses him. Which is a little reason. weird. And then she tosses him into a waterfall. Into a, into a river. And and then Jason spends the next couple of years, I'm sure, learning well, about well, his life, I think. You know, well, she also, the last thing he tells him is, you remain unavenged. So implying that she's the mastermind behind all of this? Yeah. Yeah. Which, let's be honest... If he just went to Bruce and was able to go to find Bruce Wayne, one, Under the Red Hood wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Because I, I'm, like... I just I also just want to talk about the back cover of this book that proudly boasts, plus the immediately sold out Batman Annual number 25. And, yeah. like... Man, this is what you I, get. You you understand why people want to buy this because it's an important event, and it and so this is going to give us the answers. It it just baffles the mind. Yeah. So oh, and, and and then and then we just double down on the hush thing. Um, yeah. So about. yeah. So so we see then Jason getting angry, angry at both the certificate of his death, and then that the Joker escapes. He lashes out was like okay that's that's fine but like that turned him evil so he still has contact with talia who puts him in contact with hush yeah and like there's Which... nothing in hush to imply that talia knows hush like... and also Raish is an active enemy of Hush. Yeah, like... Also, because, you know, we're now near the... Like, we're just... We're near the present. This this doesn't work? No. It's like, oh, like, he... And it's just like, he's like, oh, you had... He had to see him. It's like, you know, not as a man, but as the creature he created. So, you see, you, see, you know, Jason getting beat up. You see Jason fleeing... The clay face switch happening. Okay. Um, sure. And yeah. It, it's there. Trust me. I swear. It's there. And this was what made him finally resolve to do the Under the Red Hood as a story? Like... Yeah. Never mind and... that he didn't... In Hush, he didn't, like, explain to Bruce what happened at all? Like... No. Like, it... And explicitly switching with Clayface also means Bruce thinks you're still dead? Yeah. Like, I... Like, I don't... You know how perfect these first 13 issues are? Like... <laughs> they're fucking great! What a, what a perfect analysis of Bruce Wayne and Jason Todd as characters, and the Joker for that matter. And then this happens, like... Also, he now has the white streak in his hair, which I like as a Jason Todd design. Mm -hmm. But also... I also don't blame them for getting rid of later on. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it's like, oh, so it's like, yeah. May, then we end with, like, him deciding to become the, the Red Hood. Yeah, which and also that's... implies that he didn't know about the Red Hood moniker before this. Which... Because okay. it's just him looking at a newspaper clipping, like... On his conspiracy, I don't, I don't know. It's... He's got that. He's got that stupid fucking like thing that I hate in media, where um, where like they tie like string between two so... like two tacks. Like, okay, let me just talk about that quick. I fucking hate that thing so you much. Do? 
I okay the cork okay I don't mind like the idea of that little like oh let's connect the dots here whatever but like okay how impractical is it to put like some pieces of yarn stuck up by like thumbtacks so a cork the thing? idea is when it's done well is usually they're like color coded to help organize ideas and see okay, crossover so just like use fucking tape or like an erasable marker or something you know that's I'm just that's... saying like it's 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 just but yeah um. <laughs> Uh, that's that's where the annual ends. Yeah, and I am all the sadder for it because, like, I it, it says it's written by Winnick, but it doesn't feel like Winnick's writing it. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, was there an editor who was like, um, oh, also. Uh, they include the hush scene with Jason Todd and Clayface here. Uh, I'm going to show you where it is. Okay, so go to where it says Chapter 11, The Game. Yes. Okay, flip the page twice. Hang on. And it is the top right panel on the right-hand page. Uh, hang on. I've, I've got to find where it says Chapter 11, The Game first. Okay, yeah, Chapter 11, The Game. Is that the, wow, gosh, where's so, the kind of this? Okay, so flip the page twice then. Wait, I haven't yeah. found it yet. I'm I'm having trouble okay. finding it. Is that the uh Jason Holden? The, the the how could you let me die? That that big page. Uh do you see it? Yes, there it is. Okay, so flip forward two times. Okay. Top right hand panel. With that's Jason him jumping. That's it. That, yeah, that's him jumping away. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, that that that's supposedly where it happens. But I, I'm that, sorry. That's what that, yeah, it, it's it's really stupid. Anyway, so that was under the red hood. <laughs> it's. Um, I still gave it a nine out of ten. Like. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, like it's, it's, it's a it's a fourteen issue book. One issue being ass is only worth like knocking off one point. I'd say. Yes. You know. Heck, I like like. I I I loved most of it. Like, yeah. Oh, it's it's, be... it's. I would argue it's one of the best books we've read in the podcast. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, it, it's it's certainly up there. Um, yeah, like it's um, it's just I the annual is different. But let's let's yeah. let's let's just move on from the annual and discuss the film for a little bit. Just yeah, little the bit. film we we've mentioned quite a few times throughout this for good reason. It's it's one of the best animated dc films out there um i absolutely love it it's a perfect adaptation like the it cast really is. is perfect like it does a really good job of cutting down what needs to be cut down um mm-hmm. uh, for a film like i wrote so it streams like the adaptation to basically to basically 635 to 638 and 648 to 50 mm-hmm. that's the bulk of it yeah um, yeah you know it's the casting is perfect uh that final confrontation is perfect. Jensen Ackles. Oh, my God. He role. crushes it. And and we already mentioned, like, John DiMaggio as Joker is so good. Um, if you ever wanted just, like, an animated Joker that doesn't at all try to be a Mark Hamill copy and still nails it, it's this one. Like, it's it's perfect. It really is. Um, DiMaggio plays it very yeah. flirtatiously, too. Oh, um, totally. Totally. He's got some I, really great lines in there. Yeah. Um, um neil neil patrick harris's nightwing is right it's such great casting yeah oh, oh, um, yeah and, um, and also I mean, and also because they save the the helmet taking off scene until later in the film i do like how they do the reveal with the voice matching scene yeah yeah like I everything really everything just comes together they add they in streamlining it they obviously you know add some different scenarios Mm-hmm. Cut off the and and, and also the it, they they add a much better origin for the resurrection of Jason Todd. Um, yes, so that. in the film, it's it's so in the film it works especially because they change the death of Jason Todd too. Um, so he's uh, so that you know race is involved with the death in the family idea, and there's mm-hmm. no mother. And also because it's a film and it can work in its own little universe, I like the idea that resurrecting a completely dead person or throwing a, a completely dead person into the Lazarus pit had never been tried before and they didn't know the effects it would have on Jason. Yes. 
So I, I like that idea. Um, I think, and they also imply that you know that that also fucked him up too. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Which the annual tries to imply, but it it yeah, and just doesn't capture at all. Doesn't capture so. it really it really well, especially since, and and, you know, and 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 to be fair, Joe Winnick adapted his own script. Yes, um, what, one can feel like the way they brought back Jason in continuity was a DC mandate to tie it into Infinite Definitely Crisis. Definitely, at least a little bit. Well, you know, especially fascinating because uh, six thirty five released in late two thousand four. Mm-hmm. Like a whole year before Infinite Crisis even started. Yeah, yeah. Like they, they clearly didn't have a planned way to bring back Jason yet. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised. And, and, to, and to be fair, like like at the end of the day, how Jason came back is not important. I think. Yeah, I wouldn't like, be surprised. It, if it's it's was, about what was, bringing back the character means. I, when it was, I wouldn't be surprised if Winnick's initial plan was just doing a Lazarus Pit, and that was nixed. Well, to be fair, five issues in, they they nixed the Lazarus Pit idea. Yeah, but by that point, Infinite Crisis would be starting, right? So, mm, well, that's only five months in. Yeah, but you you would have you you would have John's ideas for that story involving Superboy Prime and and the punch that broke the multiverse, the Great Retcon punch, <laughs> the Great Retcon punch. Um, I'd like to read Infinite Crisis someday. I hope it's actually a good story. I, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. I've only read it once a while ago when I was trying to read like all the big DC events like back to back, which back was a really back. bad idea. Like, yeah, because that's like event to a, event to event. Yeah, and it it just it it really just kills your enthusiasm really early on. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that. Um, that's the film, and I guess without further ado. I guess it's time. Uh, well, to wait. Don't we have to do plugs first? Or we, I, I, we will announce the episode first, and do then we, we have to. Jacob, or we, Jacob, you know. Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. Okay, we're gonna preface this. All right. So once again, this was the first episode I had chosen because I wanted Jacob to act to read an actively bad story, or at least a story that most people agree is bad. We had never done this before. And again, Jacob can dislike any book I throw at him. Yeah, Whatever. Heck, I disliked this, a decent chunk of death in the family. Yeah. That... Like, I, but but at the end of the day, like, I, I'd never chosen... I, I like to think that everything I've thrown at you so far is at least decent, or at least widely regarded as good. Um, this, though, this next episode <laughs> is something truly special because it is really really bad and i chose it because it's bad and i wanted to celebrate 30 episodes but jacob i guess without further ado do the whole spiel say next time on fresh face comics you know so um take it away so here's the fun part i could say i could go rogue here and say anything no but i won't uh next time on fresh faced comics we are bringing back our first guest and returning to the world of Frank Miller in The Dark Knight Strikes Again. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so fucking excited. You have no idea. Like, <laughs> I hate this. Oh my God. Okay. So, just okay. So, Jacob has known about this episode for a while. A long um, while. Yes, um, <laughs> only because I told you a while back that, like, you know, I, I chose it because it's a bad story. Um, and you had, like, a couple ideas in your mind. Um, but also I said that we would have a guest on episode 30 and that it would be Amity coming back from episode 5 when we did Dark Knight Returns. Um, so <laughs> so you sort of put it together. And, uh, and yes, we are reading The Dark Knight Strikes again. Also, just a fun little anecdote before we uh, yes. close off the episode. Um, you you had been told me at w- the moment you knew about this that you're like, I'm not buying it. You're like, I'm gonna like rent it from a library or something. I'm not gonna buy it. I'm not gonna have it in my collection. But I know you, and fairly recently even, I was like, Jacob, you know you, right? You're a completionist just like me. You're gonna want a copy in your collection because imagine you. We finish off like the first block of like fifty episodes, and there's just one book missing from your collection. How much is that gonna kill you inside? And so you did buy a physical copy of The Dark Knight Strikes Again. <laughs> I paid seven dollars in total, and not <laughs> only because there was something I needed that I needed to have next day delivery on, like last minute what what other excuse could you possibly want 
Yeah, so... Well, um, at least it won't be the last episode of 2022. We have... I think we, we have one more after that. Yeah, right? one more after that. Wait, is that seriously all we have left for the year? Yeah, yeah, it's how Holy the Holy shit, that feels fall. weird. That feels way closer than it actually is. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Weird. So, yeah. All right, let's start closing off. Um, be sure to follow us on Twitter. I am at Jomo with three underscores. He is at Newt5996. I'll leave those linked in the description. As always, if you want to buy the book that we read on the podcast, I'll leave an Amazon link to that down in the description, as well as the next book that we're reading on the podcast, which is still in print for some reason. Um, for some reason. Uh, do you want? To, do we want to do the viewer request for memes? Uh, oh, yes, please. I almost forgot to mention that. Okay. We so, have decided gonna... because so for the those art... of you that. For those of you that watch the YouTube copy of, of the podcast, um, what we typically do for those is I'll start off the episode, I'll have the thumbnail in there, and throughout the YouTube episode, I'll have, like, panels from the comic throughout there, you know, just to, like, see what we're talking about as uh, just a visual reference as we're talking about it, whatever. Um, but the art in The Dark Knight Strikes Again, for those who are not aware, is truly awful. It's some of the worst art, comic book artwork ever. And I think instead... Of uh, of having that uh, uh, th th that artwork subjecting people who watch the YouTube copy to that. Instead, we're going to opt uh, to to have to make some Dark Knight Strikes Again memes. So if you want to uh, to have a hand in that, how uh, the meme format is basically just have a picture where you can see somebody's hands. It doesn't matter whose at all. Um, just a picture of anything, absolutely anything, where you could see somebody's hands and they have to be holding a copy of The Dark Knight Strikes Again. You could slap it on super lazily. Um, I'll th post some examples on Twitter. You can go check those out there. Um, just literally anything. Any picture you want, as long as somebody like is able to hold a copy of The Dark Knight Strikes Again in their hands. Um, I'll leave, uh, like I said, I'll leave some examples on Twitter. Be sure, uh, if you want them, in the video, because as long as you make the meme and send it to us, the meme will be in the video. So so send it directly to us, either add us in it or leave a hashtag. What do we say? Like uh, hashtag Frank Miller strikes again. Yeah, hashtag Frank Miller strikes again. All right, use hashtag Frank Miller strikes again. Tag us in it. Once again, I'm at Jomo with three underscores. He's at Newt5996. Like I said, I'll post some examples when this episode comes out um, and you guys can check that out. And, uh, and just make some Dark Knight Strikes Again memes. I already have a couple of them that I've made just jokingly on Discord calls, but I would love to have a ton more just to throw into that YouTube copy. I think it would be so funny. So, yeah, um, if you want to participate in that, go ahead. You can go do that. Um, but, yeah, still follow us on Twitter. Participate in that if you want to. Also watch our Star Trek videos that I'm doing with my brother. Um, we're watching right. Star Trek for the first time. That's been super fun. Yes, um, as, been, as of this being out, you've made it four episodes in, I believe. Yeah, four episodes in. Uh, we just put out the Naked Time. So yeah, um, it's been it's been really fun. It's been a really fun time. Uh, anything else to plug on your end? Uh, well, uh, make sure you come back next time for our pain. Uh, <laughs> It's going to be so much fun. And I fully expect, so fun. if you follow us on Twitter, uh, remember to uh, look whenever we end up recording, uh, ask us questions, give us moral support, really anything for this next episode. Yeah, yeah, uh, we can we can definitely use it. So, <laughs> uh, all right, I guess that about does it, right? All right. Uh, all right, so until next time, this has been Joey Morgan. And Jacob Licklider. Goodbye. Goodbye.